The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Just when you thought I was done gratuitously marketing to you, here I come again with a huge, huge, huge end of the show blowout sale on all merchandise. That's right, every goddamn thing we have in our store is now 50% off from now until the end of time. Yep, half off of everything, because without all that sweet, sweet Patreon money rolling in, I'm going to need some money from my weekly poker game. So please, please, please help me take a few steps closer to realizing my dream of becoming a professional at guessing if my cards are better than someone else's cards. Hey, I could be a professional at worse things, like marketing and advertising, or conspiracy theory podcasting, or cartography. Okay, maybe not cartography, that actually sounds cool as fuck. But hey, here's your map to savings. Click the merch link in the show notes or go to oculturepodcast.com and click on merch. Fill your cart to your heart's content. And when you check out, use the coupon code GOODRIDDENCE to get 50% off everything in our store. That's coupon code GOODRIDDENCE for half off of tees, hoodies, hats, and whatever else ended up on there. I don't even know. And while you're at it, if you want to PayPal me some extra cash, I mean, maybe email me for my PayPal info. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where the only map we really trust is the human heart. I am your host, Ryan Peverly, and welcome for the final time to the D program. Thank you so much for being here. Your time, your energy, and your attention is much appreciated. Those are valuable currencies, and, you know, please do not forget that. And if there was ever one episode in which you should set everything aside and devote some of that undivided currency to, let it be this one. Dylan Lewis Monroe is in the house. Some of you know Dylan from his work on what he calls the Deep State Mapping Project, where he's put his artistry and creativity to work to develop detailed visual artworks that explain the many connections among the Deep State, the Q-Web, as he calls it. But he's also produced some other diagrams along those same lines, two of which we'll dig into here, the Cult of Baal and the Healing Web. Two pretty different diagrams, to be sure, but two diagrams that I think bridge together personal interests of mine, both past and present. Now, this one does take a bit to really get going, because we cover off on some of Dylan's personal background up front, but once we get going, we gone. I would recommend pulling open the show notes, too, and following along with the diagrams as we talk about them, if you're able to. Or at the least, giving them a visit when you have more time to dissect and digest them, because they really are pieces of art with a capital A. But enough prologue, let's flip this script to dialogue and let the master conspiracist himself violate our ear holes with some of that consciousness-enhancing audio. Enjoy. Alright, so Dylan, Lewis, Monroe, welcome to the show. That rhymes. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's great to meet you finally. Yeah, God, I don't know how many times that I have postponed this chat, and I am so sorry. You know, we have went back and forth. I don't know if you postponed it or not, actually. I know that I did at least once, maybe twice, maybe seven times. I've lost track. But we were talking about doing this in person because you are in Cincinnati. I am in the Dayton area. We are very close to each other. But I've had plans this weekend, and I was not able to get down to see you or get you up here to see me. So we are here, though, right now, ready to rock as it were. And, you know, (laughs) the first thing that I want to ask you, man, is how in the hell does a 
New York fashion designer becomes Cincinnati's master conspiracist. This has got to be a hell of a tale to tell. And I'd love you to weave that web for us. You know, how did you, I mean, are you originally from Cincinnati? Yes. High school and all the way through grammar school in Cincinnati. And then I moved to New York for college and then worked in the fashion industry for six years. So sort of during those college years is when this sort of conspiracy story began because I was living near the World Trade Center and eventually one day Googled World Trade Center 7 because I had been walking by the new building. I was looking for information on the new building and that took me down the whole 9-11 rabbit hole and very soon afterwards just went down every other conspiracy rabbit hole, just trying, you know, trying to figure out everything that is considered a conspiracy theory, you know, trying to find all of them. So I was doing that for several years, but all my years in New York in the fashion industry, I had no one to talk to about this information. I totally had to keep it inside. And, you know, when I did have a conversation with someone, it, you know, it wouldn't go well. <laughs> so it was holding a lot in. And I just decided when I left fashion to switch into fine art. And by the way, like my background in fashion had been print design for fabrics, primarily and embroidery design. I mean, I did a little bit of everything, handbags, jewelry, but really for my main job, which I was there for five years, Derek Lamb, I was doing mainly print design. And that background and those skills that I learned there is really what allowed me to create this new project, at least the one that I'm working on now, and especially enabled me to make t-shirts out of these artworks much more well-designed than I would have if I hadn't had a fashion background. Because, you know, I see t-shirts done by people that have no background in that and they don't turn out as good. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a great skill set that allowed me to sort of pursue my more intellectual interests. Because, you know, in fashion, you're just doing one season after the next. It's like, how do you make it new? And from my perspective, it's gotten very stale, especially in New York fashion. I mean, it's a little more exciting in Milan and Paris, but it was just really the same thing every season. And there started becoming so many different designers with the popularity of Project Runway that I just, you know, I needed a change and I had to get out of New York too. It was like, I started becoming more and more aware of the fact that these big cities, like especially like New York, LA, Chicago are like hubs of Illuminati culture, of mind wash, of brainwash. Um, I had several apartments where there was cell phone towers literally like, across the street or across the building right next to me pointing at my room. So I just had to get away from all that radiation. And so I came back here, started fine art. And after the first project I did sort of wound up doing this conspiracy related art project that really took off because of the interest in conspiracies that was stewed up by QAnon, which I know you don't want to talk about QAnon too much, but <laughs> worth a brief, brief mention to just explain like how this project took off, why this project took off. Because the first year I was working on the deep state mapping project, which is sort of conspiracy art, I didn't think it would ever find an audience. I mean, I knew no gallery would ever be interested just because it's too controversial. And so it was kind of a miracle that QAnon stirred up all this interest in conspiracies. And then when I finally did release publicly, you know, the first full high res download from this project, the QWeb on New Year's Eve 2018, there was this huge response to it. So I was very fortunate for that. And I've been able to use that huge response to sort of build it into my full time career. Not that I'm making a ton of money, <laughs> but at least it's like somewhat sustainable. And it seems like there might be a hope in the future to have this be like a more of like a sustainable, bigger business. Yeah. And so many things I want to ask you just based off that answer. But I mean, isn't it odd that in 2019, you can, you can even do business in the world of conspiracy theories? Like, don't you find that to just be fascinating? Yeah, it's definitely the times have changed. And not to say like, because I endorsed Trump, but I started this project because of Trump's inauguration. And the fact that Trump had been on Alex Jones during the campaign trail, who at that time was sort of like the main conspiracy guy. You know, I think now some people have decided that he's some kind of intelligence agent, but I still think he's made some contributions to the field. But anyways, Trump, you know, did that interview with him. And so there was this sort of message and a few other things Trump had said, like in interviews suggesting he's sort of like open to the idea of conspiracies. Like he's not going to attack anyone talking about conspiracies based on what he said himself. So that was sort of like the impetus for this project. And then also like that gave me like the security, the feeling of safety and releasing these artworks publicly that, you know, I wouldn't have a hit team knocking on my door, <laughs> a hit squad. And, you know, just try There's definitely been roadblocks trying to build this business because it is a subject matter that I don't think you can become like a millionaire off of. 
you know, not going to have the promotion through Facebook or Google that a business selling, you know, socks printed with kitty cats would have. (laughs) Because, you know, they always want to promote like bullshit and stuff that's sort of, uh, how you say, like lowering the consciousness, whereas stuff that's raising people's consciousness is just basically shadow banned. (laughs) It's the word. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, dude, I think you can become a millionaire off this stuff. The problem is, if you do become that, you're probably under the control of somebody else who's pulling the strings for you, like an Alex Jones or... I don't know, there's a couple of podcasters in this space that I'd probably throw in there too, but I'm not going to name any names. But if people know me, they will probably know who I'm talking about. So, Well, I think, you know, if you're the biggest one in the world, it's highly suspect, like Joe Rogan. (laughs) Well, obviously, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Yeah, PewDiePie, if you're a YouTuber. (laughs) Yeah, I never really watched any of. Is that a? That's a man, right? I never watched any of his videos, so I don't know. I thought he was just like a video gamer. Is that not the case? He started as he is still pretty much a video gamer, but he does some like slapstick comedy or skits that he's of his own creation too, hmm. and okay. sometimes some social commentary. I think that's what sort of got him in trouble and started this whole YouTube apocalypse. I know you were just um, before we started talking, telling me about how. You know, YouTube views and clicks seem to be dropping off. And I think PewDiePie was one of the ones who started that with some Nazi jokes that then everyone had to pay the price for. Yeah, I mean, that just might be a greater censorship conversation. I don't know if it's just YouTube. I think it's probably big tech in general just clamping down on, you know, shit they don't like. I mean, after all, these are private platforms. They're free to use for a reason. You don't really actually, you know, have any say over what they allow on it. So, you know, I want to go back to your time in New York City. You you mentioned 9-11. You mentioned, you know, walking by the World Trade Center. I imagine like you were in college post 9-11. What was the environment like then? You know, was it the early 2000s, I imagine? I don't know how old you are. I'm just guessing based off your, I think like your biography on your website I was looking at earlier. So what was the environment like then? And I'm curious too, because you said that, you know, you were in the fashion industry and you couldn't, you know, talk to people about conspiracies, but man, I know some people that have worked in fashion and still do. And dude, it's shady as fuck. (laughs) Well, yeah, you're right. I I left high school in 2003. Well, I graduated and then I moved to New York. So, you know, this is two years after the big event, (laughs) 9-11-2001. And that area was still very disheveled when I got there. I mean, there was still like a pile of rubble for a while. So that just shows you how long it took to clean it up. I don't think it was smoking anymore, but it was definitely a huge construction area almost the whole time I was there. I mean, it's, I think there still is construction in that area. But yeah, you know, I arrived as a 18, 19 year old in New York. And the first thing was just like a major culture shock of being basically middle class or upper middle class in Cincinnati and getting to New York and just everything being so expensive and just everything being so hierarchical and like, you know, being under 21 too, like couldn't get into any clubs. And it was just a mix of people, like, especially going to college there, you know, you, you, I had this vision of New York, like from movies like Studio 54 that like, I just wanted to like live the club life. And I get there and it's just a bunch of people from all over the country that thought the same thing as me (laughs) and Studio 4 didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, a bunch of kids trying to get into like, the nightlife in New York was basically killed in the 90s. You know, at the end of the sort of club kid era, there was this big crackdown on nightlife and just nothing was fun anymore. It was just all about like paying $100 for a bottle at a table. And yeah, just, I mean, in college, the college pretty much took up all my time. Like the curriculum I was in didn't even give you hardly any options for options at all, really. You know, you had, there, there was so many courses that were required that I think I took like one screen printing course that was actually my favorite course in all of college that was like an elective. A lot of it was just like figure drawing. It was pretty much a huge waste of time. I mean, I think I learned a little bit of art history, but there was a whole lot of other history I wish I would have learned more about. I, I took one course in astronomy too. So, you know, I always did have higher interest than fashion. And I, even when I went into fashion, I was on the verge of going into fine art too. But my family said, you have to do fashion because fine art is not uh, something you're going to ever you know, have a career in. But I, I, had, I actually had worked on a book called Regenesis of Civilization early on in college that just showed that I was thinking about a lot of these higher concepts, even though no one around me really had an outlet to have those conversations. And I never really finished the book, but it had like a whole outline. And then it totally relates to what I'm doing now. So it was, it kind of like prepped me a lot of the research to explore what I am exploring now and really digging in deep and finding a way to publicly present these ideas. Yeah. Okay. So what was the name of that book again? 
regenesis of civilization. Okay. And I've not heard you mention that in some of the interviews I've listened to you in. Uh, what was the book about then? <laughs> yeah, I don't talk about it too much because it's sort of like an aborted project. And I don't know if I would ever finish it because I wrote most of it before my views of the world really changed after I discovered all these conspiracies, you know, starting with 9-11. But there are, you know, there are really interesting parts of the book. It was basically about how our civilization right now is structured based on natural selection and capitalism as an extension of that. And how, like, what would happen if we decided to restructure our civilization by just, you know, sitting down at a table and, I mean, basically what you would call socialism, but, you know, happy socialism, because we avoid the pitfalls like that. But, you know, just how will we structure civilization if we had, like, a, another go around at it and how, how that might come about, too? Like, I was really focused at that time on the rise of artificial intelligence. Like, I had read the earliest book I read that's discussed within this new project, the Deep State Mapping Project and the Q-Web, the earliest book I had read related to any of these subjects was The Age of Spiritual Machines by Ray Kurzweil. And, you know, I learned about all these futuristic technologies, nanofog, like the possibilities that will exist in the future, some of which exist now. And I was just really, I was basically really futurist minded. And so that book was my outlet of, you know, doing research. And then it was actually a dialogue of two people discussing, you know, how to structure civilization based on these new technologies we would have. So you would call this then, uh, I guess, nonfiction, right? Yeah, it was a nonfiction. It was like okay. a dialogue. Like I was kind of inspired by Galileo's dialogue of the planets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ambitious project for a, you know, freshman, sophomore in fashion. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, speaking of fashion, let's go back to that real quick because, you know, I mentioned that the industry is pretty shady from what I have learned about it. And I was just learning, you know, from some secondhand experiences shared with me uh, from some people who I've encountered uh, during my professional career here in marketing and advertising. So, you know, I'm curious, like what your <laughs> fashion experience was like. You've worked with some pretty big brands in the fashion industry. People would know, you know, like uh, I think Marc Jacobs is on your resume, right? Yeah, I started you, interning oh, at Coach and then um, I worked at Derek Lamb for five years was my main job. And then Mark Jacobs for one year as jewelry designer. So those are the main ones. Then I did some freelance for Hugo Boss. I would say overall in fashion, it was just really cutthroat and really like this pressure to put out so much product, like not even caring if it was garbage or not, or, you know, how much waste we're creating. Just like it has, there has to be, while I was in fashion, we went from two seasons a year to four seasons a year, just so that we could have fresh merchandise in the store. It was like a marketing idea. And I, the whole industry is controlled basically through Vogue. And I think pretty much through like Anna Winter, she's kind of like the gatekeeper of everything. So there's definitely like a creepy vibe there, especially, you know, if you've seen Devil Wears Prada, like, <laughs> that's like the ringleader of it's just <laughs> emanating this sort of narcissistic attitude and actually, after that movie came out, I think a lot of people in the industry saw it and like got the idea that this is how you're supposed to act. <laughs> and that's sort of an example of reality mimicking fiction. Because yeah. people saw that and they thought, oh, she's so powerful. Look how mean she is to everyone. Like, oh, I, that's how I want to act if I have power. <laughs> and <laughs> I noticed some of those traits like popping up in certain supervisors like after that movie came out. And it was just really bad. I had a few bad experiences with a few Australian supervisors that sort of tarnished my view of the entire continent, but <laughs> not to be a racist against Australians. Um, but then, you know, you see, obviously, the models we use for shows. Like, I didn't see anyone being exploited, but they're obviously really young all the time and just seem kind of, like, confused, like, being tossed around from one place to the next. Um, I didn't see anyone getting, like, really, like, horribly abused or anything, though. But just the whole industry, like, at high fashion especially, you know, it's not a nine-to-five job. It's a fucking lifestyle. And... Yeah. You know, they expect weekends, they expect you to work till 9 p.m. And my best friend who's still in fashion is still living that life. And I'm just like, I don't know how you keep just doing that for 10, not just six or five years like I did, but for 10 years. I mean, some people do it for their whole life. So, I mean, I shouldn't complain, but you really give up your whole life to it. And it's, a, it's an honor to work for these high brands, supposedly, until you realize that, you know, your life is gone and you spend it all doing whatever at nine o'clock at night, designing more and more and more shit that people don't need. So, <laughs> oh, man, you are speaking my language. Yeah, I set the expectation at my current job that I was leaving at five o'clock. I didn't give a fuck what anybody thought about it. So 
I think that's part of what it is, is, you know, like you have autonomy here on some level and you should exercise it when you can. And I think creating those expectations in your day job. And I know, I mean, hell, I'm assuming most of the audience that we have here has a day job that they probably either don't like or don't want to be at. And maybe they know that they're working, you know, too many hours at, but, you know, take that power back somehow, you know, figure out a way to set the expectation that you are not working more than 40 hours a week, you know, that you are not staying past five o'clock or past whenever your shift ends. And I, yeah, I can only imagine what it's like, you know, at these these fashion companies where it is, you know, such like a competition, you know, to to have the next big thing and to put merchandise into all these stores and like you have to be the brand that everybody's buying and wearing and it's like, man, just give me a fucking t-shirt and a pair of jeans and I'm good. And you know, give me a hoodie, I'm good. So no offense to you if you like high fashion still, Dylan. I'm not trying to <laughs> throw it under the bus, but it's just not for me, you know? Well I've definitely realized that a lot of my extra income that I spent on high fashion was basically a waste of money then because, you know, now I have all these fancy clothes that I don't even wear anymore. Um, But I always had the ambition to do my own thing. And I always wanted to do t-shirts as well. So what I'm doing now is really my ultimate dream. I mean, I didn't think I would be the one running the vendor's booth at these conventions and having to set up the booth and fold everything. (laughs) You know, I thought I'd just be like designing and putting on a fashion show, but I'd rather do this grunt work and do it myself and be independent than have to kiss Anna Winter's butt and, you know, somehow find an investor. I mean, it wasn't really an option to do it the other way, but, you know, I'm glad to be independent and not have to have anyone to answer to and be able to design whatever I want and not have to worry about, I mean, I should probably worry more about copyright infringement or like, you know, people complaining that their names are on my artwork, but I haven't had a problem with that yet. I mean, I have had my first website was shut down on Shopify after it was really blowing up after my interview on Edge of Wonder. And that was like my first time when my business seemed like it was becoming actually sustainable because I was getting a ton of sales and then shut down by Shopify and took me six months to rebuild a new website which is, by the way, for everyone listening, deepstatemappingproject.com. It's set up as a homepage with information and store. So under information, you'll find all my free downloads, all my previous interviews, and then specific websites for each of the artworks I've created that give you more detail on each artwork. Then obviously the store has t-shirts, posters, which is really my bread and butter at the moment. And my main item I sell is actually called this Intel Packet which is something I mail out personally. And I just basically include laminations of my two color artworks and then cardstock on various different color cardstocks. Like it's all custom bought by myself and then printed individually of the different artworks. And, you know, people just really love that product because I sign a few of them and it's sort of like a, a personal connection thing and you get extra flyers to red pull your friends So, you know, this started as just sort of like an add on to when I was shipping a frame, but then I realized that this would be a great individual product and it's actually become the most popular product in my store. So that's cool, even though it's a lot of work to put these, you know, throw all this cardstock into an envelope for all these different people. And I'm obviously never going to become a millionaire shipping out these things for $30 a piece, but it just, it really feels like a grassroots operation towards the goal of, you know, just enlightening the general population and especially the fact that I'm including extra flyers for people. It's really a tool to red pill both yourself and anyone you know. And these things are designed as like the most effective red pills I could possibly create. Specifically, like the five inch version of the QWeb flyer is designed as the most effective way to introduce someone to the larger picture of history that's encompassing all these different, you know, you could call them conspiracies. I like to call it the hidden history because so much of it is not a conspiracy anymore once it's been declassified. And it's just history that's, you know, maybe been reported once in the news, but then sort of forgotten when it really should have been integrated into a more central point of our understanding of history as a whole. Yeah. And let's sort of step back a little bit. And just for people who don't know, like what you're actually talking about, you know, you have created all of these different sort of, I guess you would call them maps, uh, some keys as well that explain how to use the maps. And you're essentially just mapping like the url in your for your website says you're just mapping the deep state and the q web that you just mentioned is like you said the most popular piece that you've created and i told you before i did not want to talk about it but damn it you've kind of forced my hand here i just want to <laughs> you explain what that is to the audience who's unfamiliar with it you know and, and just be a nice refresh for people who are familiar with it yeah we can just move on really briefly cuz actually what i've realized is 
it might not be the most popular one anymore, at least for people coming to my project with fresh eyes. But anyways, briefly, the Q-Web is a timeline of humanity's hidden history from the present all the way back to Atlantis. And so I started basically mapping out every conspiracy I had heard of from the 20th century, putting arrows of specific connections that were of heightened interest to me or ones that I might forget otherwise if I didn't have an arrow. Most things were related to the CIA within the 20th century, but then I wanted to take it all the way back to Atlantis, you know, sort of based on like the Ancient Aliens TV show, some of the ideas presented in there. And then I actually had to do a ton more research to fill in my understanding from everything in between the pyramids of Egypt and the beginning of the 20th century when this stuff is sort of better documented. And so that research from that period of before the 20th century through as early as we really know, so Atlantis, that's what became the cult of Baal diagram. And so what I was just kind of saying was what I've started to notice is that at these conventions I'm going to, most of the people that come up to my booth haven't heard of it before. I mean, I'll get like one or two fans. I had a few more than that in LA, but at this one, I just got back from AlienCon in Dallas. Most of the people that came to my booth had never heard of my project before. So they're just like, you know, they look at my diagrams and they're like, whoa, you've done a lot of research. <laughs> and I would say definitely, at least by this last alien con, the cult of Bill is winning out popularity wise in terms of posters sold, interest, flyers. And so the cult of Bill, definitely look it up if you're listening to this, because you know, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about unless I explain it. But it's also a timeline but it's in the shape of the Kabbalah tree of life for the Sephirot is what I like to call it. it has multiple names or the Quippelhoth is like the evil version of it. But I've sort of stripped out all that original meaning that was in that shape with the nodes and what they were originally labeled and just turned it into a timeline that goes all the way from the pharaohs of Egypt through to the USA and tracks the major power players and how they're connected. So I think when people, you know, when people see the Q-Web, they kind of see like a gray blur of just all conspiracies. There's not really much to focus on. But when people see the Cult of Baal diagram, you know, you clearly see these main players that everyone's heard of, the pharaohs of Egypt, kings of Babylon, Roman Empire, Judea, the Vatican, Templars, Khazars, Switzerland, Masons, Jesuits, Illuminati, USA. And I think it's sort of easier to understand like what I'm trying to say in this diagram because you look in between all those two or all those, you know, factions that I just mentioned and you see how they're connected. And it's not always, you know, it definitely requires more explanation than just one word as I put on the diagram. But I've done some of that explanation in the margins of the diagram, sort of around the term on the main structure. So there's sort of the main idea and the explanation all on one piece of paper. And there's definitely, you know, a lot of room to do more research beyond that. Cause you know, I'm trying to cover what, like 5,000 years of history on one piece of paper is kind of a lot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, this diagram really is winning out as the more interesting one to newcomers. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Why do you think that this particular diagram has captured more attention recently than the Q web, I guess, or any other web or chart or diagram that you put together? I think it's just some, some more something to focus your eye on, you know, in the center. And it's also something recognizable. So, you know, people are generally drawn to like these, uh, how would you call it, like sacred geometry shapes, like the, you know, the flower of life, the tree of life. And so when they see it, they see something familiar immediately. But then when they realize it's not what they thought it was, it has that intrigue. And I'll tell you, especially in Dallas, basically every middle-aged man with gray hair that came up to my booth uh, had a highly suspect feeling of them being like Freemasons. And Freemasons are definitely interested in this diagram, even more so than normal people. Because, you know, you look at masonry and I have you know, the date, 1717 United Grand Lodge, and then sort of the halo of that node is Luciferianism. And that could be a reason for them to get up in arms with me, but they're just really intrigued. And, you know, they don't say, oh, it's not Luciferianism to my face. They're just kind of like, hmm. And, you know, I don't know a ton about it, but I know that, you know, the word on the conspiracy street is that Albert Pike explained and I think one of his letters, I'm not sure if it's in his book, but it's documented that Albert Pike explained that Luciferianism is the doctrine of Masons above the 32nd degree. So I think 
when Masons see this diagram, they kind of see it as an opportunity for them to actually get knowledge that hasn't been presented to them yet through the organization. You know, I'm not saying I know all the secrets of Masonry by any means, but they definitely are intrigued by it. And I think that's why, I mean, I'm kind of making an assumption there, but I think they see it as sort of a way for them to like dip their toes into some knowledge that they're supposed to get, you know, three levels down the road <laughs> and maybe an opportunity then for them to advance quicker within the organization, having that knowledge and having a reference tool of, you know, these 5,000 years of history that I think a lot of it is sort of what you learn within these occulted organizations and esoteric history. I'm not sure how much history they teach you versus just magic, but hmm. it's definitely, you know, Masons have libraries within probably every lodge and major libraries within the primary lodges. And a lot of this information is the same thing that you would find sort of in esoteric books within those lodges. So it's definitely what their whole belief system is based around is this kind of alternate history that's mainly hidden from normal historical timelines. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the diagram that we're talking about is the Cult of Baal. You've mentioned it a couple of times. What does that term, though, Cult of Baal, actually refer to as you understand it here? So just the idea that the religion within the highest echelon of the elite is not Christianity, not even really Satanism, but it's this ancient religion that goes all the way back to the deity Baal. And it could even call it like the Cult of Enlil, <laughs> but I sort of Bill has a better ring to it. And Bill is one that's associated with human sacrifice. It's mainly considered like a Phoenician deity, but he also has parallels even earlier. Like his parallel in Egyptian culture would be Set. And I guess that's kind of as far back as it goes. Well, then Enlil, obviously, within Sumerian religion. But sort of start, chose to focus on Baal because that's the first one that that incarnation of that sort of deity archetype that really became heavily associated with human sacrifice. And people really tie that to the Phoenician culture. And there was definitely statues of Baal where people were doing human sacrifice of children, child sacrifice within Phoenician culture that the Romans supposedly stamped out during the Punic Wars. But the idea is that that practice was actually being still practiced within, within the elite levels of Rome of all of these different civilizations, like they all kept the same religion in the most high level. And a lot of people talk about the death cult lately, um, the death cult within the elite. And there's a ton of different names for it. I mean, calling a cult of bell is sort of a convenient name for the diagram, but it's not the official name of the cult or anything. I mean, some of them probably do consider themselves Satanists, especially within like the Roman Catholic church. I think at the high levels is definitely highly tied to Satanism and they know it. Um, with the synagogue of Satan being mentioned in the Bible. But, you know, there's all different cults within the elite. You know, it's not all one thing. Like, I think there's probably still a cult of Saturn. There's probably still Italian families that are, consider themselves the cult of Hades. There are high-level Masons who are Luciferians. And not all these people get along with each other. You know, it's not a cohesive cult. Like, they're all, <laughs> they're all about the backstabbing. And, you know, if you're sacrificing babies, you don't really have morals in too many other fronts. You're just basically in it for yourselves, in it for the greed. But the general idea of, you know, Satanism is it's more like service to self as opposed to service to others. And obviously, wealth accumulation is a big factor in that. So I want to kind of run through this diagram in the center, you know, with this tree of life portion here and just sort of like take people through it. And, you know, we'll link it in the show notes so people could pull it up and follow along with us if they want to. But, you know, you mentioned this Baal worship is connected to human sacrifice. And then, so you have those two sort of things at the top that feed into this first level here of the Canaanites or the tribe of Dan. What do you know about them and what's their story like, I guess, from what you were researching? Canaanites refers to the people of the region we now call Israel and is basically the oldest. I mean, this is like talking biblical era. So even like before Sumerian civilization, and they're not necessarily the only ones that were around. It's just those people were the ones that sort of diffused into then Egypt and Babylon. And they're probably the ones that I know the least about because, I mean, there's really not much information about them online when you try to research it. But they were ox worshippers, I would say. Let me get this straight. 
they definitely had Baal around back then. So, you know, that was like their primary deity. And then as they moved into different cultures, the name changed. So, and then it was also Baal associated with the Phoenicians, but Baal goes back even before like the Egyptians and the Babylonians to the Canaanites. So it's tribe of Dan in the Bible. I haven't studied the Bible or the Kabbalah. So, you know, I don't claim to be a religious scholar. I'm more of like a historian, but there's a reason why I don't get deep into those different belief systems and like really read the actual documents and study them is because I don't want to get indoctrinated. Like I don't, I've never been really a religious person. Um, I know that people are getting useful information out of like the Kabbalah in terms of like magical rituals and stuff. But, you know, I prefer for myself to just sort of stay removed from being actually researching the religion itself. You know, I'll I'll research like the premise of it, but I'm not going to be like reading the religious documents themselves because I feel like then you start teetering on like getting brainwashed by it. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. And I absolutely agree with that because I mean, if we talk about magic, whatever your conscious mind is taking in is rooting itself in your subconscious. So if you're reading something, you're reading words, you're watching films, like these words, these images, and you should know this, you know, being a guy who's in graphic design, I mean, like this stuff embeds itself into your subconscious. So I see how you would want to stay away from it. And, you know, take it from me, man, like I got deep into this shit for a few years. We were talking about that prior to uh, hitting the record button here and I had to pull myself out of it because I was like, I'm getting too deep in this, you know, and I'm not really liking the person I am as I'm like interacting with this stuff and how it's interacting with me. So you know, that's, yeah, what you just said is, uh, it, it resonates with me, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, so, I'll just also mention that practicing, practicing Kabbalists definitely don't like this diagram, like, whereas Masons <laughs> are interested in it. If there's anyone walking around a convention, like with the Kabbalah book in their hand and, you know, with the yarmulke on, they'll try to argue with me about this because they're like, you shouldn't be relabeling this thing. I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm not trying to not offend anyone here. So if I want to turn a religious shape into like a timeline, it's not really a critique on Kabbalah itself because now I do understand that there's light and dark factions of everything on here. So there's light Kabbalah and then there's this flip side of Kabbalah called the Klippelhoth, which is using the same ideas for evil, for serving the self. But so want to stick to kind of like the progression of the different nodes on here, the different factions within the timeline. Yeah, absolutely. With- yeah. So the original diagram actually started with Pharaohs because I was really trying to connect USA to the Pharaohs. But then I kind of threw Canaanites up on top as sort of like a predecessor to that. Um, But the the idea of this diagram really starts with the pharaohs in Babylon. And so the pharaohs of Egypt supposedly came from extraterrestrials. Like their earliest pharaoh within their mythology was Osiris, who was supposedly an extraterrestrial. And then Canaanites came in the form of the Hyksos pharaohs and established a dynasty, I think the 15th dynasty which sort of really shook up the theology of Egypt. And the Hyksos were worshiping Set as their primary deity, which is sort of an evolution of Baal. Um, And then, you know, I added in Babylon in the cult of Baal as opposed to the Sephiroth map, because the Canaanites also went to Babylon and, and Baal turned into Marduk in Babylon. And that was obviously a big, you know, Egypt and Babylon were the two big powerhouses. So the beginning of the diagram kind of starts with like the Eastern power and the Western power and how like the same people infiltrated both, like the Hyksos really infiltrating the pharaohs and the Canaanites really just becoming the kings of Babylon. And that ties back with the whole Enki Enlil theology as well. So then it sort of jumps over the Greek culture. You know, we definitely had the Greeks conquer. The Greeks kind of popped out of nowhere. Like if you look at their art, they're kind of a combination of Egyptian and Babylonian, but their culture really sort of popped out of nowhere. And I, I feel like something might have happened, like some new force might have arrived. I mean, I'll I'll call it extraterrestrials because that's just the mind that I'm in. But it seemed like the people of Athens got some kind of download. And I'm not sure where it came from. I don't think it was just like, maybe they found some mushrooms like on a hill somewhere. (laughs) And that's the leap in evolution. But there was there was a leap in evolution somewhere. But then the Greeks conquered the pharaohs. But then they adopted the culture. And then the Romans eventually conquered the Greeks and Egypt again. And you really see like, so I have on this diagram, Cleopatra being the tie between the pharaohs and the Romans. And that was actually who Julius Caesar married right before the Roman Empire became established. But there's even more connections than that. I mean, more recently, I've realized that 
one emperor, or actually it wasn't even an emperor, but there's a pyramid in Rome. And so like, this is an example of one of these sort of synchronicities that I've come upon that I had no idea about it before, but then it actually confirms even deeper, like the connections that I was trying to establish on the Cult of Baal diagram. So there was a big interest in like Egyptian culture in Rome, and there was a merging of the royal bloodlines through Cleopatra. And actually, there's a theory out there um, purported by Ralph Ellis that the grandson of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra was actually Jesus Christ. That's actually not on the diagram, but <laughs> there's sort of like a preliminary theory of who Jesus Christ might be on the diagram, which is suggesting that he might have a connection, or at least his story might have a connection to Apollonius of Tyana. I'm not sure exactly who I heard that theory from originally, but there's several different theories about Jesus, and this we didn't want to get into that subject. But just well, just wait a minute, out. because that's interesting to me because of the. So let's say we go into uh, our conspiratorial Rolodex here, and we pull out Jesus. Right, we could look at like a theory that Jesus, the image of Jesus that we see, was you know some sort of like Roman elite person. I forget the guy's name. Uh, yeah, maybe, I've heard maybe that it was one. like a like a Borgia or something like that. I'm I'm not really sure, but. So when you say that Jesus Christ was, you know, maybe the grandson of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, are you talking about a Roman elite that we're looking at the picture of that person now and that's that same guy? Are you talking about legitimately Jesus Christ as we know him in a biblical sense, like the son of God, like all of that? Well, I guess he wouldn't be the son of God if he was the grandson of Julius. Well, that's Julius. that's what I'm getting at. Is like so it's it's really just a, a mortal man whose image is now like everywhere as Jesus. Is that is that who you're talking about then? That's the idea that Ralph Ellis presents, and I've listened to him speak about it several times and he has a very convincing argument that Jesus Christ was the son of I guess it was the daughter of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. And then she married into the Persian Empire, but then was exiled. So Jesus actually did hold the title to both Rome and the Persian Empire, making him technically the king of the earth, not just the king of the earth, according hmm. to the Bible. Okay. So that's a re definitely, if you're interested in that, you know, look up some interviews by Ralph Ellis about Jesus, because he has really figured out all this. He was really pivotal in me figuring out even earlier portions of this diagram with the pharaohs and the Hyksos. Um, he's one of the researchers that really contributed a lot to my understanding of this whole subject matter. Yeah, so let's get back on track here. I cut you off there. I'm so sorry. I don't know where oh, no. we were, but so I, this diagram is really hard to proceed because you know I was taking us down the left hand side from the pharaohs to the Romans, but I sort of forgot to mention the whole Akhenaten Amarna period within Egypt, which is very central to understanding where monotheism came from. So this pharaoh Tutmosis IV created the sphinx deal which i discovered the sphinx deal when i was doing this diagram and you know i've always been fascinated by the sphinx and when i realized that there's this tablet in between his two paws i was like whoa that's got to be something really important and it turns out that when you really read into it and analyze what this tablet says it's this vision that tutmosis has where sort of all the gods merged into one and this tablet in between the Sphinx paws, you know, in so many words, can be seen as the first sort of monotheistic idea that came into the world. And from my understanding, I think that that idea sort of stewed within that royal family for a couple generations. And the Pharaoh Akhenaten was the first one to actually institute this as a state religion, the first monothe monotheistic state religion called Atonism. And it didn't go so well the, the first go around, you know, and his history was wiped out from Egyptian history. It's questionable whether he was murdered or not, but his city and his religion and the history of him was attempted to be erased. Somehow it's come back very prominently recently. And just, you know, while we're going, another confirmation I've got of the, the research I found in this diagram was this Egypt exhibit that just came through Cincinnati. They had, you know, the whole history of Egypt mapped out. And they had a very specific section about Akhenaten and actually this huge wall. I mean, the fact that he was the one pharaoh who was sort of wiped out of history, that his representation in this exhibit was proportionally massive. <laughs> so that confirmed to me that, you know, whoever's putting on this exhibit, which is probably, you know, connected with these big historical organizations, the Masons, that... Akhenaten is a very important part of the history to these people who really are in the know now.
And, you know, they're obviously not trying to keep it secret anymore. They, the Egyptians tried to wipe out his memory because he sort of defiled all of their original pantheon of gods. But nowadays, for some reason, I think they're trying to get people to become more aware of it, maybe to get people to realize the origin of Christianity. I don't know. But so that was a confirmation just to see him represented in this Egypt exhibit that came through Cincinnati. I'm like, wow, all that research I did that I thought I was off on like, you know, crazy tangent that no one really cares about. It's like right here in this exhibit, like a huge wall. Yeah. And I find random people like the girl that I work with, Taz from Baltimore at these conventions, she has this like obsession with Akhenaten. And it's just so crazy that like a, you know, a random girl from Baltimore, like almost thinks she's like the reincarnation of Nefertiti. And when I was with her in, <laughs> in Dallas, she was like, maybe you're the reincarnation of Akhenaten and I'm Nefertiti. I was like, maybe. <laughs> but so anyway, he's, he's really important in understanding where monotheism came from. And he sort of had the first failed attempt at it. But then the priesthood that learned from him, learned from his mistakes, I think eventually became the Vatican, you know, through several generations and different transformations. This idea of a one God system, they realized really was the best structure to support monarchy. So monotheism supports monarchy. When people are used to worshiping one God, they they become accustomed to it, to the idea that the power of that one God can come through only one ruler, like one Pope or one King. So there you have like the real origin of Christianity. (laughs) Mm, Yeah. That's fascinating, man. So we get into the um, kind of the middle of the tree here and you took us through uh, the Roman empire. You were talking about, um, you know, Caesar and Cleopatra. And then I think we should probably move over that monotheism path and talk a little bit about Judea. Mm -hmm. Well, so the big question that I kind of pitch on this diagram, not in the most obvious way, but is the idea that the original biblical kings, so King David, King Solomon, were actually the 21st dynasty of Egypt, I think, or let me just, the numbers are really small. I'm not sure if it's 21st or, yeah, 21st. That's sort of a theory pitched by Ralph Ellis. There's different theories out there, but the whole who was King David, who was King Solomon. I think probably most people realize if they know anything about Freemasonry, that King Solomon is so central to Freemasonry that they've built every lodge as sort of a replica or inspired by his original temple with like the two pillars. So that was a real focus for me trying to figure out who he was, why he's so important to the Masons. And it has to do with the Ark of the Covenant, the technology that they might have recovered. But the idea that the original biblical kings were actually the 21st dynasty of Egypt in the historical record sort of changes around everything within what we know about Judaism. It introduces the idea that when the Jews were supposedly conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, exiled to Babylon, and then came back with their Torah presented by Ezra, you know, it puts into question the idea of whether they ever actually had the Torah there to begin with. So, you know, was it really a religion that got sort of conquered, banished, and then brought back? Or were they just Egyptian pharaohs worshiping either, you know, Atonism or the original Egyptian pantheon? And then Ezra came with the Torah and said, oh, I'm your ancestor. Like you guys, you know, three generations ago, this was your holy book when he's really like an agent of King Cyrus and this is some kind of like population crowd control technique. (laughs) So that's sort of in the fine print on the diagram, which, you know, I'm giving you the fine print right now, but <laughs> that, I, that idea is out there that, you know, the whole religion of Judaism, obviously the root of Christianity was sort of a manipulation by the Babylonians. And, you know, it's more evident every day, the fact that, you know, we just see this Babylonian influence everywhere. When you understand Babylon, you see more of the influence and our whole economic system is you call it Babylonian money magic. So there's religious ideas, there's economical ideas that all sort of goes back to Babylon. And I don't, it's a theory. It's a theory about where Judaism came from. All roads lead to Babylon, man. I've heard that term or that phrase uh, for a while, and I guess maybe that's what they're talking about. Exactly. So the connection between Babylon and Judaism, or Judea, sorry, you, it's, we got to keep these terms straight because Judea is a kingdom, I think, within the Roman Empire. So it's like a a territory, a region. It's not saying Jews. It's not saying Judaism as a religion. It's Judea, the territory. And it's important to understand that, you know, 
this territory was always in like rebellion with Rome. They were trying to like conquer it. There was several years of wars called the Judean Wars, which I learned about doing this diagram. I hadn't really heard of that before. But the the Romans destroyed the the temple, and then you know they took all the the loot, the booty back to Rome in the Vatican. So it's sort of interesting that they then switched to Christianity later on, and you know had Judaism as the root of the state religion when the state had basically stomped that religion into the ground and burned it, burned it to the ground. I think there's a, they say they didn't leave one stone on top of another when they finished with Jerusalem after the Roman campaigns by Titus. So that's just an interesting dichotomy that they went from sort of trying to like stamp out this religion to incorporating it as like the fundamental of the belief system that became the state religion of Rome, which was Christianity. So there's just like, what are these, what are the motives here? <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, everyone knows that the Vatican or Christianity came out of the Roman Empire. They they tried a few other mono, monotheistic religions before they arrived at Christianity. The main one that's mentioned on this diagram is Sol Invictus, which was another sort of sun-focused central monotheistic deity religion, which didn't fly. And they eventually had that Council of Nicaea and sort of picked and chose which gospels would become Christianity. And that's just such an important moment. I mean, that's one of the central things on this diagram that's written right below the word, the Vatican on that central node council of Nicaea that, you know, all these Christians who, you know, they say they believe the Bible. It's like, well, you know, (laughs) I mean, where did the Bible come from? It came from the council of Nicaea when Constantine and handful of these Roman elites just decided what goes in it. And they, you know, decided a lot of what didn't go in it too, which was all that Gnostic belief system, all the Gnostic scriptures. And, you know, there was other branches of Christianity too, which I've learned in researching this period, you know, the Cathars, the Gnostics, probably even other like similar, similar, smaller divisions that got completely lost in history. And it's just, you know, this most powerful one that was connected with the royal bloodline and what became then the papal bloodlines that sort of won the day. (laughs) So, you know, I I have a real problem with people who just hold the Bible as the ultimate, you know, doctrine because it came from man. I mean, you can't deny that in that council of Nicaea, they decided what's in and what's out. And then they attached like Judaism to it, which, you know, according to the Gnostics, you know, shouldn't have been attached to the teachings of Jesus, whoever Jesus was like, but I mean, we don't know who Jesus was, if he even was, but you know, there's sets of, there's obviously a set of writing that describes his teachings. And, you know, I think most would agree that it's a pretty peaceful doctrine, you know, in general, that was obviously completely inverted by what happened later on, what the Vatican, you know, how the Vatican used those teachings and interpreted them. So it's like, how did, you know, there's a lot of people who would say that the Old Testament and the New Testament are contradictory to each other. You know, it's two different belief systems that 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 aren't incompatible. And, you know, somehow Christians can deal with this incongruity and incorporate it without, you know, experiencing cognitive dissonance because they think it's all one thing, but really is teaching, you know, the old Testament is teaching to kill all your enemies and, um, you know, cut the, cut the womb of the woman and not leave a soul alive. That's a heretic. Whereas the new Testament is saying, turn the other cheek, be forgiving. And it seems like, you know, throughout history, the Vatican has more like followed the Old Testament's doctrine, you know, they haven't really shown forgiveness to heretics, especially like during the Inquisition. So you could say it's even more heavily influenced by the Old Testament and the way it's been practiced. But, you know, that there are still Gnostics and there are obviously good Christians who do take these teachings of Jesus and use them for good. So at this point, it becomes a little bit confusing between like the East and the West, left and the right, because the Vatican, everyone knows the Templar sort of came out of the Vatican doctrine. The more I've researched this, it's actually the Vatican didn't create the Templars, but the Templars came about during the Crusades. They formed independently in Jerusalem and then later got sort of approved by the Vatican, which kind of made the Templars more of an independent group. You know, they weren't completely under the control of the Vatican. When you research the history of the Crusades, it's really kind of a shit show, like a free for all. And, you know, they were taken hostage by other parties of interest, specifically like the Venetians at different points. But 
obviously at their core, you know, the Templars were defenders of Christianity. And so thereby, it's to some degree taking orders from the Vatican. But, you know, my perspective on them has changed even significantly since I did this diagram, because I think that there were factions of them that were even more independent than I gave them credit for when I did this diagram. And that's part of the reason why my new YouTube channel is called New Templars, because, well, it kind of actually comes from the movie Kingdom of Heaven, but that's a movie by Ridley Scott about Templars, about the fall of Jerusalem to Saladin. And it just, it gives you that sense of like the honor of a knight. And they have this, this oath that the Templars do in the movie that's like, speak, uh, speak truth if it leads to your death, protect the innocent, just basically like chivalry. And there is this really good idea of chivalry that goes back to the Templars. But then there's also this idea of like genocide and (laughs) killing the infidels that goes back to the Templars. So the idea of my YouTube channel, New Templars, is sort of taking those good ideas that harken back to the Templars and saying that, you know, these are the ideas, the morals that we want to embody now in our quest for truth, you know, sort of like a crusade for truth that we're on now. Um, So that's just a little side note about why I named my channel New Templars and how my opinion on the Templars has changed a lot since I did this diagram. Because a lot of what I learned about the Templars when I did this was influenced by this YouTuber, Sean Ross, who has three different channels on YouTube, the Central Intelligence Agency, Guy Uri, and Chat Zafrats. (laughs) But anyways, he's like a, a traveler of Europe, and he goes around Europe pointing out symbolism within the stonework, and he just knows a ton of history. I mean... It's really sad because his family's been sort of torn apart by the Swiss system of government because, you know, he was sort of putting out information that they didn't like. And so they've destroyed his life. And he's just kind of like a wanderer now. Somehow he's a YouTuber, too. But he has really great information. And all the research he's done, actually, him and Ralph Ellis, I'd say, were the biggest influences on me in creating this diagram. So check him out and Ralph Ellis if you want to get, like, the deeper look into this. So... We established, obviously, the Vatican is connected with the Templars. Then lesser known of a connection is that the Templars sort of originated the banking system that we still use today. They started Western banking as medieval banking. And what's really I got from uh, Sean Ross is the idea that the Templars then went and established Switzerland at the end of the Crusades. Now, that's not necessarily admitted by mainstream history. But there's just so many hints and clues you can see both in stonework, in history, in the way Switzerland is structured today, and in the symbolism that tells you that, yes, it was the Templars, at least some of the Templars that originally started the country Switzerland. And I think Switzerland is the one point on this whole diagram that people are probably the most surprised by to see Switzerland as, you know, in between the Vatican and the Illuminati as such an important player in this. And I still think that they are, you know, they do deserve to be right in the middle right there because that is where, you know, Geneva is the central center of world government. Basel is the center of world finance. Zug is actually the center of world cryptocurrency, but that's sort of a a lesser important one. (laughs) Uh, there's a lot in Switzerland, like the whole country is basically a Templar fortress. So there's a lot to understand there. And, you know, it's the intersection of the French and the German and the Italian. So it's kind of like all the major European power players, like that's the center of it all. Let me just jump in here for a moment, because I think it's important to point out too, and this is just a very sort of superficial comment, but the Swiss flag is modified Templar cross, perhaps, right? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Just a more geometric one. Yeah, that's one of the most obvious symbols that, you know, anyone can see. Not to say that every cross is, you know, related to the Templars, but yeah, you know, the colors too give you a hint because the Templars was a a red cross on a white background and the Swiss flag is a white cross on a red background. So it's like, ooh, you really tricked us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, that also goes back to the the, uh, Knights of Malta too, which we could talk about later when we get into the healing web. Yeah, actually, I have thought about possibly that where the Templars are on this diagram, it might actually make more sense to have it be the Knights of Malta there because the Templars were sort of like the more rebellious, what would you call it, like society, whereas the Knights of Malta sort of stood the test of time and remained more loyal to the Vatican. So I think actually in the context of this diagram, it still makes sense to have the Templars there, but the Knights of Malta in that position would make almost as much sense 
And actually, they sort of won out at the end of the day because after the Templars were sort of excommunicated, the Knights of Malta absorbed a lot of their wealth. And then the, the Knights of Malta started running basically the medical system that would become Western medicine, which, if, yeah, like you said, we'll get into on the healing web. But then the Templars became the Masons. So they're still very powerful too, but they're sort of at odds with the Vatican. So we sort of jumped over Khazars time-wise, timeline-wise. The Khazars are very important to understand in terms of the timeline of what happened in the East. And the idea is that a lot of these people who were fleeing Judea, a lot of the Jews fleeing Judea after the Roman persecution sort of ended up in this region between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And they were powerful, influential Jews named Radonites established trade routes that covered the entire world, which when you see a map of this and understand like when this happened, it's like, wow, <laughs> how did they have trade routes going over the whole world back then? But I guess, you know, they were, that's what they did. Like they were just well connected. And Kazaria was positioned in the center of this entire global trade network. You know, they couldn't use obviously no airplanes. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Well, maybe airplanes, you know, if, if these deities had had a Vimena or whatever, but Kazaria was the center of the Silk Road trade route. And so it became a very powerful and rich area. And what's actually also not on this diagram, something I've learned. So, you know, every interview I do is different because I've learned new things since I did this. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but I, I believe that the Khazars and the power that was there actually was sort of some of that was funneled into Tartaria and the Tartarian Empire, which is sort of like old school Mongolia, but it actually encompassed Russia, Mongolia, China, almost all of Asia at, at its height in the 1600s. So the Khazar Empire went into decline eventually. And some of those people, which they eventually converted to Judaism, that's the main point here, like why it's an important point on this diagram is because the Khazars were a mix of Jewish exiles and descendants of Attila the Hun, like these sort of like nomadic, you know, Mongolian type people before Mongolia existed. And so it was a combination of different people. And that's some something that some people have a hard time wrapping their minds around that, you know, a culture is not just one people. It's actually most of the time a culture is, you know, one ethnic people as the elite and then a different ethnicity of people as the main population. And the main population might not even really realize, you know, sometimes the elites like try to pretend that they are like the people when they're really not just a different people, but possibly even a different species. <laughs> hmm, yeah. So Kazaria is an important region. And like I said, I've learned more about Tartaria since I think some of the people when, Car Tar when Kazaria dissolved, they moved into Europe and sort of became the Jews of Europe. And then other ones were incorporated into Tartaria emerged with the Mongol people and maybe influenced them. So we have this like this like elite Jewish influence within these Central Asian cultures as well. And, you know, the history of Tartaria, I don't think we should get into all that right now, but it's basically this empire that became very large and powerful that has been completely sweeped out of history books. Sort of similar, very similar to Kazaria. And that's, you know, why these two cultures are connected, Kazaria and Tartaria. I mean, just even in the name, you can kind of see that, you know, when two names are that similar in a similar region, you know, they're kind of connected. Is that the same Tartary Empire that like um, Anatoly Fomenko is talking about? Do you know him? I don't know that researcher. I mean, I've been trying to find good sources on it and I've had a hard time. Is he a good Tartaria researcher? I think he might be a good starting point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not too sure. He's Russian, so I don't know if his stuff is available in English, to be honest, but... No, I know I've heard him mentioned on <laughs> I've heard him mentioned on uh, uh, some other YouTube videos and things like that, but I, he's pretty controversial too. So I mean, you know, take it for what it's worth. Yeah, Tartaria is a really controversial subject because there's so little information really out there. I mean, there's only like a few, couple or three or four like really old books that kind of describe what's going on there at different points in history, and you see it on a lot of different maps. But that's you know Tartaria under the Khazars and Knights of Malta under the Templars are the two points that are sort of important to understand that kind of should be on here, which, you know, if I ever did an another version of this, I might add. But so then we have, you know, we have Switzerland becoming this sort of central banking hub around 1291. 
then we get into a little bit of a jump here. So Switzerland is the one who kicks off the Inquisition. And there's a little bit history of that in the margins about, you know, the different Swiss philosophers that sort of envisioned this idea of, you know, burning women at stakes for being a witch. And then that triggers the Protestant Reformation, which then the Vatican creates the Jesuits as a response to the Protestant Reformation. So this area becomes a little bit confusing about how the Masons eventually come about. But, you know, we have Venetians connecting Switzerland to the Masons, which is not so much a direct connection, but it's more like a time period connection. So we had the Venetians really at the height of their power in the 1500s when, you know, they were controlling different crusades. They were the center of the economy. They would have kind of like economic or um, conventions, you know, they'd have like the conventions of all the products coming from China into Europe would be like featured in Venice. And it was this big cultural hub while at the same time, you know, they're developing these sort of occult traditions, like based around that festival, they have carnival. So I think you know, when you imagine a Venetian mask, like for me, the first thing I think of is eyes wide shut. <laughs> and that that tradition of carnival and this sort of dodgy elite, the black nobility, this all comes out of Venice. And I think a lot of those traditions eventually filtered down into the Masons by the time the Masons went from, you know, a stone builders guild to a fraternity of elitists, which sort of really got well, then actually we have this sort of progression, the Dutch East India Company. How does this go? So basically we have like a banking takeover. So the banking kind of starts in Switzerland with the Templars. And then we have a banking capital that jumps around Europe. I have it listed here. Banking capitals moved from Florence, Italy, to Hamburg, Germany, to Amsterdam, Netherlands, and then finally to London. And one of the really interesting things that I discovered when I was doing this diagram was that England was actually conquered by the Dutch in what's called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And this is like, it's totally part of history, but nobody really knows about it or nobody really acknowledges it, especially not in English culture, because it's sort of like a shameful thing for their culture that they were sort of defeated by the Dutch and didn't even put up a fight. Like Hmm. the Dutch had become so wealthy from the Dutch East India Company, which that in itself became wealthy because of an alliance they made with the Jesuits. And then William of Orange took this huge fleet of ships to England, basically showed up. They were already weakened from a few other wars and just said, you know, we run this place now. (laughs) Uh, So that's how the Dutch took over England with that glorious revolution. And then you see that that was actually an extension of this banking system that was sort of creeping over Europe already because shortly after that 1688 revolution, the Bank of England established in 1694. So we're looking at this sort of quadrant right below Switzerland and between Switzerland and the Illuminati. And then it's sort of this progression that happens rapidly after that. You know, they establish the bank and then it becomes United Kingdom as we know it today. And then just 10 years after that is the first Masonic Grand Lodge in England. And, you know, that's not necessarily the same people that established the lodge, but it's very interesting that, you know, the bank arrived and then it became the country we know today and then the lodge came. So it is sort of, I think there's a connection there, even though the Masons were not completely in cooperation with the Jesuits or the Vatican. But, you know, there is a connection. There's kind of like, you know, there'll be an alliance to the extent that they'll help each other to subdue the main population. But then when it comes to like, who's in the highest power, there's a little bit of a conflict there. So we're almost to the end. <laughs> <laughs> we are, man. Sorry. Do you need to pause for a moment? No, no, I'm good. I mean, it, it actually gets more simple from here down because, okay. you know, the Jesuits, th- people think of them as, you know, the educators of the Vatican, the missionaries, but really what they are is sort of like the CIA of the Vatican. And there's a few different books about them where they're described as God's assassins. And they just start, you know, killing anyone they want for the Vatican. They start trying to control the monarchies of Europe and they just become too out of control to the point that the the monarchies, you know, in power tell the Vatican, like, we got to do something about this. Like, your people are out of control. And so the Jesuits get suppressed 1773. And then shortly thereafterwards, this man, Adam Weissop, who was a former Jesuit professor, establishes the Illuminati, which is sort of an outlet for the Jesuits to exist under suppression. 
another name of them. And immediately as, as that is established, their mission is to go back and infiltrate the Freemasonry. So for the Jesuits to infiltrate the Masons, and they do that through the Scottish Rite. And that is how the Illuminati eventually did infiltrate the Masons. So, you know, there's this question of whether the Masons were always sort of like evil. And, you know, any Mason today who's on the lower level, you know, who just gets into like the York Lodge and, you know, is a, what do you call it, like the Blue Lodge or I don't know. The low level Masons today think it's just like for Christians, it's all good. It's just fraternity, brotherhood, you know, boys helping each other out in business. They don't realize that at the highest levels, we're talking, you know, politician, president, and even higher than that, which would be like black nobility, bankers, highest level bankers, CEOs. It's a very different type of society. And, you know, they intentionally keep the lower level people in the dark about what's going on at the top because they th- people have morals at that point. And it's like a, progress- a progressive, through the different initiations, you progressively erode a person's morality until the point, you know, at the highest level, they're doing like sacrifices and, you know, ritual rape and whatnot. Not that I know all the rituals that go on, but, you know, enough, <laughs> enough has leaked out about what Illuminati rituals are and what like satanic rituals are that, you know, when you see these warning signs, like, to do with the Masons, you know, there's all of this skull and bone symbolism. There's just, there's, there's a lot of warning signs <laughs> that, that at the top is not, it's not happy go lucky, like best for humanity. I mean, maybe it's best for humanity from their perspective, but from an average person's perspective, they'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> so, you know, we're really close now to getting to where, the USA is established actually the same year as the Illuminati, which really blew my mind to realize that those dates line up exactly that the Illuminati 1776 and USA 1776. One thing to note about the Illuminati is that on this diagram, Illuminati is the Bavarian Illuminati established by Adam Weiss up in 1776. Now that term Illuminati could actually be used to describe everything on this diagram. So like all the elites going back to the Pharaohs, even before that, Some people refer to that as the Illuminati. That's sort of like the colloquial Illuminati definition. Whereas this diagram is talking about the specific group that named itself the Illuminati in that year, which really only existed for, I think, about 10 years. Um, Do I have on here when it was disbanded? I'm not sure. I think it got disbanded like 10 years or so after it was formed. But then it was just even more secret. (laughs) Yeah, It just became completely like cloak and dagger infiltrate i mean they're they're basically going under the the flag of the scottish right as they infiltrate these other societies so what do you make of the i know you said that it blew your mind when you found out that the illuminati was formed in 1776 so was the united states that is an interesting correlation i had this interesting theory many years ago when i first found that out too but that's like maybe it was one in the same like maybe the u.s was just formed as a uh, sort of you know proxy of this group i mean even though the group itself was just forming like maybe there was some actual like direct connection there i don't know if you found anything that may indicate that these two things were actually connected in more than just date it's definitely possible i mean the big question that i think a lot of this raises is that were the founding fathers who were masons were they good guys or were they doing satanic rituals on the side? And I think that the answer to that would be that some of them were good and probably some of them were (laughs) doing satanic rituals on the side. And I'm not going to say which ones I I haven't even thought about which ones were which, but you know, there's, there's signs that Alexander Hamilton was a bad one, but yeah, like everyone knows that our country was sort of designed as it says on this diagram, Masonic Atlantis. And It was definitely a step in a more humanitarian, positive direction than monarchy, which was what we were used to. So it was progressive. It was something new to the world. It was a constitution like no one had ever seen before, at least in action. And so I think there's definitely very positive things about the establishment of the USA that can't really be denied that, you know, this was, this was forward for civilization And even, you know, after the establishment of of the USA, I think civilization was still advancing, like through the Victorian era. And obviously a lot of these inventions that came out of the USA, it was, you know, a huge step forward for humanity. And, you know, if Masons were behind that, then, you know, there's, there's no way to say that's not a good thing. 
And obviously, you know, they didn't establish USA as like an openly satanic country or anything. I mean, we have religious freedom, but it's always been predominantly a Christian country. So yeah, I do think that there might have been some influ- some Illuminati influence like at the as far back as the founding of our country. But there was it's always been sort of like a struggle for power at the USA, you know, going back to the American Revolution that, you know, the king, he didn't give it up without a fight. I mean, there there are signs that they did let the country go or that they let it go under the circumstances that they would still control the banking, which is really what they still do today. But we then get into this period in the USA, which you could call the bank wars. Now, the bank war is a specific time in 1829 dealing with Andrew Jackson. I think that was actually the establishment of the second bank. But the whole history of our country can be looked at from a banking perspective because you know we were in debt after the revolution and then they created a national bank with, I think, a 20-year charter that pretty much everyone who was a patriot here like didn't really sit easy with. And if we go through this this time of the USA when we're sort of struggling between having this national bank with international creditors and really being independent. And so Jackson was a president who really fought against the establishment of another bank. And, you know, we're talking about this international banking system that's all stemming out of Switzerland. And at this point, it's kind of going through the Bank of London, becomes sort of like the satellite office of that Bank of Switzerland, because they hadn't established like the central bank in Basel yet. But the bank in London was an extension of that, which is controlled by the Rothschilds. And so you, the U.S. history is this history of like the banking system trying to take back control of the USA after the revolution. And, you know, the Civil War has something to do with this. You know, the Civil War was not just about freeing the slaves and, you know, who has more morals about slaves or who doesn't. It all goes back to these banking qualms. And, you know, the Civil War, there might even be a tie to something to do with Tartaria. <laughs> like It gets really complicated there, but we're not really sure. But as the banking system finally starts winning this struggle to control America, we see the Act of 1871, which sort of converts the USA into a corporation as opposed to a republic, which it was before. And then through some tricks like sinking of the Titanic and killing off the opposition, they eventually established the Federal Reserve in 1913. And that sort of seals the fate of the USA as being, from that point on, like the pawn of this global banking system, which they then used to sort of diffuse the wars in Europe or, you know, control who wins the wars in Europe. And then, you know, later on controlling the wars in the Middle East. And we basically became the proxy army of the Bank of Switzerland through all these different intermediaries, you know, the Bank of London, the Vatican. But as they established these international councils, I mean, this gets, this cult of bill basically ended with the Federal Reserve, but it's important to understand, like, as these international councils are formed, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, and even others I've heard about more recently, like um, Cambridge Analytica, Tavistock Institute, Heritage Foundation. I mean, there's all these different groups that are just composed of these international elitists that are creating policies for the USA that, you know, they hand to our politicians that aren't representing the people. And it's, you know, it's a corporatocracy and it's also an oligarchy and it's also controlled by foreign interests. And when you get into the the 20th century, it's also controlled by Nazis. So that's the gist of it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's the gist of, oh my God. Like that feels like we talked about this for three hours already. So, hey, I do want to say though, uh, I don't know if you heard this theory uh, going back to the bank and the, the bankers wars and things like that, that And this has nothing to do with anything, but when you were talking about Alexander Hamilton, it popped into my head. I heard somebody talking about this once. I don't remember who, I don't remember when or where, but that the people that are on the U.S. money, like the actual dollar bills, the coins and stuff, are people that historically were actually opposed to the idea of a central bank, whether it was the first one, the second one, or the third one, which was the thing we know as the Fed now, and that this is more of them like being sort of mocked for losing that war like essentially so i don't know if that's true because you know if you if you look at the bills like let's start with the dollar you got washington Mm -hmm. on the one dollar you got lincoln on the five you got hamilton on the 10 which is odd because he's the only well i guess no because when you get up to 50 there's grant i was gonna say he's the only non-president uh 20 was andrew jackson who you just said was against the idea of a central bank grant was 50 ben franklin 100 and i don't know if there's any more than that because i'm poor but, you know, I'm <laughs> curious, like, 
I don't know if that's if you've heard anything like that, but that is that's to me is sort of thought provoking because it would make sense that like these elitists who think that they're better than everybody and that who established the Fed back in 1913 that they would totally desecrate the memory of the people who were their opposition by printing their face on the the money that they did not want to be issued from a central bank. Definitely. I mean, you know, I do I do know that they they had George Washington on the silver certificate like before it was a Federal Reserve note, but you know, I'm sure Andrew Jackson would be very ashamed to be on the Federal Reserve note today because he was really opposed to it. Yeah, and it goes back to the Civil War too. But that made me think of it too because you mentioned how you know there's much more to that story than we're told, and I agree with that. I've read into that too. Some uh, every war is a banker's war, so the fact that you had a civil war within the U.S. between two warring factions obviously went down to money because you had the Confederates create their own bank and they started to put out their own currency. And and I don't know how that works if they're being mocked like both sides, because you had Lincoln like sort of, you know, leading one side, Grant the other. And I'm not sure how that theory holds up necessarily, but it was an interesting theory I heard about, you know, in one of my many rabbit hole ventures on YouTube. So for what it's worth, I guess. Yeah, there's some other stuff about that civil war that's kind of interesting too. Like the pay sores was the, basically, the family of the French monarchy had come to the USA as the Virginia Company and renamed themselves the Pesor. So that's mm-hmm. actually, I think, the son of Marie Antoinette, who was killed in the French Revolution. And so you have, like, you know, the French monarchy becoming one of the most powerful, influential families in the South. And it's just like, what's really going on here? Like, it's very much a conflict between the different European powers. Like, when we see it as our civil war, it's really like the French versus the English. I think there was more German influence in the South as well. So there's, you have to like have this much broader perspective of world geopolitics, even back in the 1800s that most people just ignore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a whole other, and it really is not like, it's not inaccessible, you know, it's not like it's not able to be digested in an easy format either, because it's there, it's on the internet, you know, if you just do a few searches, like you'll find all the stuff that we're talking about. And, you know, I mean, whether it's true or not, whether you believe it or not, a whole other thing, but the information is accessible, and you can make of it what you will. So we just totally broke down, or I guess you did, (laughs) I sort of sat and watched, but (laughs) you totally just broke down your entire call to bail diagram, uh, as it relates to the tree of life there in the middle. And I want to transition now to the diagram that I like the most from all that you've done, and that's called the Healing Web. And you know, I've heard you get into this just a little bit on some other podcasts, but not to any sort of depth that that I think uh, we could get into if you wanted to. You know, it's it's totally up to you how far we take this. But I do want to transition to this diagram, and I want to start in the top left, and I want to just go through this. You know, sort of like chronologically, we mentioned the Knights of Malta earlier and how they sort of established what we know as like the Western medical, I don't know if I call it a system, but definitely Western medicine as a whole and and how we think of like the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma as it's known in the uh, conspiratorial circles. But, you know, let's look at that top left and, you know, tell people a little bit about, you know, I guess, first of all, like, maybe we should step back in general. Why did you create this this diagram because <laughs> it's really complex and it's actually I think more complex than the other stuff that we were just talking about. Yeah, this diagram's a trip and it kind of came out of nowhere and it's really kind of a new direction for deep state mapping project because it's the kind of out of the subject range of conspiracies. I mean, it's in it's really about alternative medicine versus western medicine is the basic premise for it, but I hadn't been planning to do this diagram. I mean, I had planned to ex- actually expand on that lower po- portion of the cult of Bale map, which is called the deity chart and do that as like a whole diagram. And I had other ideas as well, but this all started around last Thanksgiving. Just one morning I woke up and I had the idea for basically the premise of this. And I sketched it out in pencil almost like throughout the day. I kept like, sketching and sketching and sketching, just writing like, you know, the basic premise of it. And I didn't know where it was coming from. I mean, it really just came to me as like a flood of information that one day. Now, I had done a lot of research into health and alternative medicine in my past. Like when I was in New York, I went through kind of like an unhealthy phase where I partied too much. I had a situation of like a gas leak in my apartment. Uh, And then that whole thing with like the cell phone towers. So like I had been dealing with eczema and like other types of like autoimmune issues that I eventually, I at one point like really was convinced I had lymphoma. And so I did like the whole research and 
like was implementing alternative protocols to try to treat it, even though I'd never been diagnosed. It's kind of like preventative. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I dealt with eczema. I dealt with hair loss from an early age as well, which, you know, it doesn't sound that serious, but like when you're trying to cure hair loss, you just go down this sort of rabbit hole of, you know, trying to change your whole diet, trying to like figure out what's causing it. And I never really cured that one, but <laughs> <laughs> I had done a lot of this research in alternative health for those three or four reasons, which I just mentioned. And so I didn't even really realize how much information I had and how much data I had processed and had in files on my computer and in printouts and these different folders I had. And then it just sort of all spilled out in that one day <laughs> on this diagram and the preliminary pencil version of it. and. You know, I didn't want it to just be about the issues I had had. And so I looked up, you know, what are the most common health conditions, you know, prevalent chronic health conditions, you know, not these like fringe ones, not, not rare diseases, but the ones that most people are dealing with. And, you know, I lined those down the center of this diagram. And then to the, to the right, I put the alternative remedies and to the left, I put the Western medicine. I don't know if you call them remedies, uh, treatments. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the basic, basic idea of in Western medicine, treating the symptom, alternative medicine or holistic medicine, treating the cause. And, you know, it, it did very much turn into basically tr- kind of like saying that Western medicine is bad and alternative medicine is good, which that's not what I was trying to say. <laughs> but I do think it's good to know all your options. And even if you're going to go the Western medicine route, maybe there's an alternative remedy that could alleviate some of the symptoms or, you know, make the the treatment with pharmaceuticals less intense or just, you know, have it be a better experience. Or, you know, it might be good to try the alternative thing first, go that route. If that doesn't work, then do the pharmaceutical as a backup option. Cause it's, you know, it's always better to be healthy as opposed to just taking pills. And, you know, there's so much in medicine right now that's just completely wrong and backwards. And, you know, people I'm sorry to say if if you drink Coke, but like drinking Coke, you know, it's just, it causes so many health problems. And that the fact that that's not like labeled with a warning that this is going to cause heart disease, obesity, cancer, ADHD, you know, several addiction. It's like just that one product causes so many things. But so I just wanted to map everything out. And honestly, like, I feel like I had some kind of like divine guidance when I was doing this because just the way it all came that first day is almost like a download. There was something that was like beyond my normal capabilities. And then I started having other synchronicities too. Like I would, I would have like a word pop in my mind and then I would look it up and it'd be like the perfect word to describe what I want to put on this diagram in a specific place where there was like a gap. So yeah, like I, I almost like don't even take full credit for this one. Cause I feel like I did have some kind of like download uh, some divine guidance to do it. And also like when I was laying out the terms, I was like, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to be able to connect these lines in a way that would be cohesive so that they would actually, you know, hit what they needed to without overlapping each other, just becoming a huge mess. And I did have to rearrange it some to make it work, but it's like, I don't know how this all, it's like, if I had to do this again, (laughs) I don't know what I would do because it just, it kind of came together like in this mystical way. And it's beyond my normal, what I would consider my capabilities to even fit this to fit it together. Like it's like a huge knot, you know? I mean, if you look at it, especially if you look like around diet on the far right, it's this huge knot of different colored lines that it's really confusing, but it all sort of fit together in a way that made sense in the end. And if the lines don't make sense, there's an index on the back of the two page PDF flyer so that you can just read everything in a list format. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely, definitely complicated to look at and to sort of make sense of. And that's why I was like, Oh, I don't even know where I want to begin with this. Let's just start in the top left. But I don't think that's the best place to start now that, that we were talking about this, but you know, just well, go back to histori- what you're, that but, is really the only historical portion of it. So if you want true. the historical yeah. perspective of Western medicine, that's well, in the top left. I do. Yeah. And, but before we get into that, you know, I just want to backtrack, you know, talking about the Coke and this is something that, you know, people who have heard some recent shows know that I, I'm, studying nutritional sciences now myself and so i'm really into the healing web here and and what you've tried to put together but you know just about the coke like this is what i've learned from my own you know sort of experience and then what i'm learning from my own schoolwork now is that 
one Coke actually is not going to really harm you. I mean, it's not good for you in general, but it's the prolonged exposure to these things, you know, over time that sort of deteriorates your system. And it's kind of like what you were talking about with, you know, being exposed to those cell phone towers. Like, you know, if it's if you're exposed to a cell phone tower for one day, like, yeah, you're going to be damaged on some level. But if it's these low level frequencies that you're ex- exposed to every day for, I don't know, the rest of your life, like, that's going to cause long-term health complications. It's not these overnight things. It's these things that just sort of build and build and build and build. And then one day when your immune system is completely fucked, that's when you find out that you're sick and you don't have any idea why. Like, you know, it might be diet, might be environmental. It could be, you know, something that happened to you when you were four years old that just manifested now. So it's really hard to, to pinpoint these things. But you know, that's, I just wanted yeah, to point that it's out. It's really people. better to do more preventative stuff than to deal with an issue after it already arises. Sure. And it's, I just feel like there's so many people getting cancer now that I sort of developed a paranoia about it and wanted to start looking into treatments before I even had to deal with that. Or, you know, if someone in your family has to deal with that too, it's like, you want to be able to advise them. I mean, a lot of people just go the chemo route, which, you know, sometimes that's the only thing that works, but you know, what if you could have done holistic treatments and actually made yourself healthier instead of making yourself sicker and then having possibly long-term repercussions? Yeah, chemo is, uh, you know, I've seen this firsthand from some family members. It, I mean, just from what we know about it, like it, it's killing cancer cells, but it's also killing the healthy cells around it. It's not targeting specific cells like, you know, say like um like a cannabis treatment would, you know, that's, I think, why people why CBD's gotten so popular, why THC, I guess, you know, sort of in combination with that has become this sort of underground alternative treatment for cancer. And there's plenty of alternative treatments for cancer. Let's not, you know, stop there. But the Rick Simpson oil that you probably read about, it targets these cells, these sick cells, these cancerous cells, like very, very, very smart way to go about it. So I'm kind of rambling here, but let's get back into the... uh... Just while you're on that, I mean, I think that's one of the most important points on here, just because the... Rick Simpson oil, or some people call it Phoenix tears. I think like the current modern terminology for it is actually full extract cannabis oil, which is acronym for FICO oil, (laughs) which doesn't sound good, but that alone is a miracle treatment for so many different things. And that's not even something you can normally buy at dispensaries. I don't think, I mean, I don't live in a state with dispensaries, but I've been to dispensaries in a couple different states. And that's not a product that's normally at dispense. I mean, do you know? I'm not sure. Uh, I do know, for the most part, you're not going to find that at a dispensary. You're going to have to like essentially go to the grow, <laughs> to the actual spot where it's growing, and you're going to have to. You need the whole plant. So what you're getting at the dispensary is not a whole plant. It's not a full spectrum, uh, whatever fecal oil, <laughs> whatever you're talking exactly. about there. Exactly, and just it's to distill that is a long process, kind of like making dabs, but yeah. I'm, I fortunately found someone local here that makes it. And I mean, I don't, I didn't really need it like to treat cancer or anything, but just to know I have access to that and to be able to tell other people like where they could get it. It's like, I never thought I would be able to even find it. Cause that's, we're talking about like the ultimate form of cannabis here, you know, not to get high, but to actually cure things. And yeah. I, I think it's so important that, that becomes something that's accessible to everyone for whatever condition they have, you know, whether it's something topical or something internal, it's like that full extract cannabis oil, Phoenix tears, Rick Simpson's oil is essential for alternative healing. And it's, it's really a shame that they don't have that at, at normal dispensaries. Well, I wouldn't expect it there to be honest, because we could talk about the marijuana boom, the cannabis boom, if you want to, but I, I don't really think we need to get into it, but you know, there's big money behind that. And uh, you have to call into question, like, you know, who is, sort of funding that movement, right? So especially with CBD, like, dude, there's some shitty ass gas stations around here that are selling CBD oil. And I know that's not (laughs) high quality stuff. So, you know, like, where is this coming from? So that's really shady. Yeah. Yeah, And with the whole cannabis boom, like the way everyone's smoking these vape pens with, you know, the little liquid in there, which God knows what's in that liquid. You know, we just had this whole thing with jewels and those type of uh, tobacco vape pens, which, you know, Trump's coming after them saying that, or not just Trump, but there's, you know, medical concerns about them giving people lung problems or them having contaminants. And that just confirms what I already suspected about, you know, I don't think people should trust just any little liquid that someone labels as cannabis or CBD. You know, I like to see 
I like organic. I like to see that it's actual a physical plant. I like to know that there's not additives. So I think people do need to be a lot more conscious of what kind of cannabis they're consuming. Yeah. And a, a way to find out if you are getting a good one is like, go on their website, go on the website of the, of the company that you're buying. And I actually wouldn't, I would not buy anything from a fucking store. Like I, I would actually want to go online. I want to see like if they have published data about the science behind like their crops and everything like that. I think uh, Ned Health, NED Health, I think is one of the best ones that I've found. Uh, don't quote me on that brand name. I, I don't know. I have so many, I have so much shit in my head about this stuff that uh, I'm trying to think if that's the one, but they should have stuff that like published data on their websites that talks about uh, their extraction process and their potency and things like that. So if you're not finding that stuff, like stay away, don't get it from your gas station down the street. Probably not <laughs> going to be that good or even that real. Who knows what it is, right? It could be just Coca-Cola in there. So you know, let's go back to the, uh, the historical component to this map, you know, uh, kind of get back on track here. But you know, Western medicine, the history of Western medicine is something that I found fascinating. I told you before we started recording that, and I've talked about it on the show too, I got really into alchemy as a subject for many years. And, you know, I'm still sort of into it, I guess. But the thing I found the most fascinating about it, I think, once I got into it was that not necessarily like the spiritual side of it or what that might mean about, you know, sort of the integration of soul or psyche or something like that, but more about like, you know, how it was actually implemented into the beginning of Western medicine. So, you have that mentioned here with the Knights of Malta uh, around the Western medicine branch here in the top left. So, you know, what did you learn about alchemy or the Knights of Malta or the historical timeline of Western medicine and how far back it actually dates into where? Yeah, well, this is not exactly, I wouldn't say I know the full history of Western medicine, but I sort of arrived, you know, having understood everything I did from the cult of Baal, I sort of arrived at this understanding of the Knights of Malta being possibly an origin of Western medicine because they started as the order of the hospital at the same time as the Templars in Jerusalem. And they were in charge of the hospital in the Holy Land. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of casualties during this war of the Crusades and they became the experts. I think that, you know, something I've actually realized through my later ideas or at B Codex is that war can actually be a propellant for new ideas, new inventions and civilization itself. And I think that's what happened with the Knights of Malta. And they sort of got battle hardened during that period of the Crusades. And they were, once they moved to Malta, after they left the Holy Land, they established their main headquarters on the island of Malta, which is in the Mediterranean. That became one of the most advanced hospitals in all of Europe during, I'm, well, it would be during like the Renaissance or so. I mean, I'm sure there was other hospitals as well, but this was the one that was connected to the Vatican. They had inherited all the finance and wealth from the Templars. So they were probably the most well-funded hospitals. So I just kind of assume, I guess, that, you know, the most well-funded hospital connected most closely to the Vatican, which was really running the Holy Roman Empire and all of Europe during the, that time period, that that kind of has to be the forefront of medicine. Um, if anyone knows <laughs> a hospital or like a, an order or a organization that was more important than them in medicine during that period, or like another one that came up, like, let me know, because I would love to add more to this. But their history sort of merges with the history of alchemy. And as people were experimenting, you know, discovering what chemicals even were, how to work with them, um, alchemy is sort of chemistry combined with magic. And that is kind of how Western medicine originated. So using chemicals to treat as opposed to herbs or more holistic methods of, you know, you can only get this one chemical from this one magician or doctor or practitioner that this sort of developed this culture of exclusivity and of elitism. And, you know, that you have these people running, running the show that are, you know, the highest level occultist you know, Vatican connected, religious, elite, I don't know what else to call them. <laughs> but they're in control of all these secrets, you know, they're the secret holders of civilization and of chemistry. And they use that to their own advantage. And, you know, I think these pharmaceutical remedies work sometimes, but more often than not, they come with, you know, more side effects than than they're worth. And so the way pharmaceuticals came about, when you see the connection of pharmaceuticals to the oil barons of the industrial 
revolution. So Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and Rockefeller, they got rich off of oil. And with that money off of oil, oil and the transportation industry, actually, yeah, they controlled like the railroads too. But with that money, they basically bought up all of the universities and institutions. And then they were controlling the curriculum of what's being taught in schools. And they made it so that natural medicines now call quack, quackery. <laughs> and all we're going to teach in universities is allopathic medicine with pharmaceuticals, which conveniently pharmaceuticals are actually made with petroleum products. So, you know, they're drilling the oil and they're creating a medical system that is based on the product that they're selling. So <laughs> it's very convenient for them. And, uh, not so convenient for people trying to be healthy, but they somehow established this monopoly and all these holistic doctors were driven out of business. And I think people really pretty much forgot about holistic medicine for the most part for many, many years. And I think it's just now starting to make a resurgence and, you know, people are rediscovering electric medicine and people are really getting a broader sense of our entire reality. You know, we, we kind of, we're brought up in this big bang chemistry model of the universe. And I think today people are rediscovering the electric model of the universe, how we're all sort of connected through ether. And, you know, there's just really basic things within mainstream science, which have been twisted or erased that have distorted our understanding of reality itself. And a lot of these holistic medicine practices are based on a more all-encompassing view of the universe that makes more sense and matches to our reality as opposed to just, you know, treating a chemical with another chemical. Your brain is nothing but chemicals. It just, I think people need a more holistic approach to their bodies and their minds to really get successful and to get healthy and to be able to understand what's really going on in the world. That went off on a tangent. <laughs> no, no, no. It leads well into, I think, the rest of the map So, or the, the rest of the web. And I mean, I would agree with that, you know, 100%. Like that's where I'm at now in my life, you know, trying to be more holistic about it. And you know, when I look at the web here on the right side, the holistic medicine part, like you are talking about things. Like you have things listed here that are so essential to your health and wellness that are not things that you put into your body. Like you have something like laughter listed here. <laughs> and I just find that to be like, it's a breath of fresh air. I mean, and you know, if there's anybody out there listening who listens to health and wellness podcasts or holistic health stuff, I mean, you've already know this or you've heard it, I guess, but you know, something like that, like laughter, like who would think like that that has any effect whatsoever on your actual physical well-being, but you know, it absolutely does. Like it's, it's a mental thing. It's an emotional thing. You know, we were talking about before we hit record, like emotional health, like a little bit and, you know, like how this all sort of just bleeds together. And I'm curious, like, you know, when you started to put this together, what surprised you the most about the holistic medicine side of this and all that it entails? Because it really is like, it's the all encompassing map to not only physical well-being, but mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual, if you want to go that far. What surprised you the most? What did you learn, you know, where you were like, oh, damn, like, I didn't know that. Well, that's actually a really easy question to answer because by far what surprised me the most when I was researching this was learning about the keto diet and not just the keto diet, but the carnivore diet. <laughs> so I kind of stumbled into this YouTuber, SV3RIGE. <laughs> I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but um, his name is Gaddis. And he's this German YouTuber who eats nothing but raw meat. So I discovered him. And I discovered this other guy on Instagram whose handle is the Dutch carnivore who also eats nothing but raw meat. And I was just like, what? It's <laughs> like, you can eat that and not get sick. And they're like, yeah. yeah. And I was interested for myself, actually, because I had been vegan in the past. And I really felt like I wasn't getting enough nutrition to really maintain my own body mass. I mean, I'm a naturally lean build to begin with. So I didn't really have any weight to lose. I was just trying to be, you know, maximum healthy, maximum cancer prevention. So I tried this vegan. There's also the social pressure to be vegan. You know, it's kind of like a, a badge you wear, like I'm vegan. So like I'm better than other people. <laughs> so I, I did that for about a year and I ended up losing a lot of weight. And I think getting probably the least healthy I'd ever been in my entire life. I mean, I'm sure some vegans will say I did it wrong, but 
I went back to chicken for a while. And then once I discovered these people eating raw meat and the keto diet, which is basically a, a keto diet is a diet that's predominantly very small amount of carbohydrate. And people have been doing this to lose weight and just to also to be healthier in general. And as I discovered that at the same time, knowing that this Illuminati diet, so jumping back to the history portion on the top left, you know, one of the things that I put up here that I think is actually really important is this Illuminati diet, which everyone has heard the stories of the elite drinking blood, doing sacrifices, like eating babies and cannibalism, basically. You know, while I think we can all agree that that is morally not okay, you know, there is this question of, well, if blood is keeping them immortal, why aren't normal people allowed to drink, say, cow's blood? <laughs> If, you know, we're killing all these cows, like, why are we, why don't we ever even see the blood as a product? Why can't we ever eat it raw? Why do we have to cook things and fry things in vegetable oil? <laughs> if, you know, what's essentially healthy about this is just the raw meat itself. Um, so, you know, discovering these, these raw meat eaters really sort of opened my eyes up to a whole other world of possibilities and, you know, I, I think that eating only raw meat is too extreme. I mean, I think it works for some people. It all depends on your digestive system, to be honest. It's like some people do better with some things. And I think that, you know, thinking about trying a keto diet or even trying raw meat is something that more people should be doing because, you know, certain people have had really great success, especially with keto. I mean, the, the raw carnivore is a lot more esoteric and extreme. It's definitely extreme. But I think, you know, we, we hear so much about raw vegan being just like the best diet you can possibly have. And then, you know, when, when someone mentions raw meat, people are like freaking out, like it's the weirdest hmm. thing ever. While at the yeah. same time, they'll eat sushi and not think anything weird of it. It's like uh, just taking up that idea and amping it up to be even more practical. So I think, I don't know if you've experienced this, but every time I've ordered sushi, I've sort of been hungry afterwards because unless you eat a ton of it, it's like they can just give you this tiny little piece of meat. And it's like, well, the reason why you like the sushi is because there's raw meat on it. So yeah, I just did a lot more research into that and, you know, really did discover and through my own practice, like I think I first tried eating raw meat around like last December and I've been eating raw meat at least once a week ever since. And it does make you feel like a lot more energized. And I think it brought back a lot of like skin color to my face. I haven't necessarily like drunk blood. Like you can't even buy blood. It's a crazy thing. Like some of these <laughs> European guys I see trying to do this diet, like they do actually go to like a farm or whatever and get blood, but I haven't been able to try that. Not that I even really want to, but you know, if the Illuminati are doing it and you can do it without sacrificing a child, then, you know, why not try it? If like, if we're trying to reverse aging, which I think is something that everyone kind of wants to do to a degree, you know, I mean, some people think it's natural to get old. But, you know, we have these stories from the Bible of people living 300 years or more. And, you know, how did they live that long? It's like, maybe they were eating something different as their diet. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we've heard stories of manna from the Bible too, which there, that's a whole conversation of what manna actually is. You know, there's some evidence that manna relates to monatomic gold, which is another sort of anti-aging supplement that I discovered in this process. And which actually monatomic gold also ties into how I, one of the different things that I started ingesting before I started getting these downloads, these sort of like channeling automatic writing downloads that became the Orit B Codex, which is a whole nother project. But so, you know, there's just first off two, two things that I discovered in the process of doing this healing web that have really changed my life significantly. Well, I am familiar with the raw meat diet. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I have not tried it myself. I did eat some really undercooked chicken a couple of times just to sort of, I don't know, I guess I was trying to work myself up to trying raw meat. And <laughs> I don't actually eat a lot of chicken anymore, but you know, I always cook a, a steak more on the rare side. But I ate some severely undercooked chicken, which, you know, you're always taught with chicken, like it has to be cooked all the way through, right? Like, it's not like beef where you have this these different sorts of levels, right? Where it's rare, medium rare, and so on. Like chicken is always just it's just cooked one way. Mm -hmm. But I remember I, I undercooked it and I was 
kind of terrified while I was eating it. I was like, am I doing this like the right way? Like, should I, whatever. Like, am I going to get sick? And nothing happened. Nothing happened to me whatsoever. I can't really say that I felt a certain way, like on a positive side about it, like physically, but I know I didn't have any sort of adverse effects to it. But my only raw experience to this point, and I'm currently doing it right now, is I joined a, a herd share here locally where I live so I can buy raw dairy. I could buy raw milk, raw cheese, raw butter, you know, because these are things that I guess you can find some some raw cheeses in your average supermarket. But, you know, you can't buy raw milk and you can't buy raw butter. It's against the law. And I think it's a state by state thing. I'm not sure. But here in Ohio... It's against the law to sell that those products directly to consumers. But if you join a herd share, it's kind of like a legal workaround. Like you're essentially investing into the cow, for example. Like you own part of the cow, so you are entitled to its milk. And so I joined one of those here locally, and I've been getting raw Dude, dairy. we need to talk because that's one of the things that I've been looking for is the okay. raw milk. Well, yeah, we'll, we, we will absolutely talk about that then. You know, when I went into this, like I had seen diagrams of superfoods being, you know, kale, acai berries, blueberries, broccoli, like that's what I consider a superfood. But then once you look into the keto diet and these people promoting carnivore, you realize that actually raw milk, like steak, butter, these are actually, oh, liver, sorry, that's the main one, the liver. Yeah. Those are actually even more powerful superfoods than, you know, these antioxidant packed berries and whatnot you know, they kind of actually blow all these vegan superfoods like out of the water. I mean, none of those vegan foods I mentioned even have any protein, which some people will argue you don't need protein, but you know, that's, so th <laughs> this diagram stirred up a lot of controversy, especially with vegans and like fruitarians, liquidarians, breatharians about which diet is the best. And, you know, I've really kept an open mind about this. Like I, I definitely didn't switch into the thinking of like carnivore is the best diet of all and everyone else is wrong because there's a lot of people making it work with different combinations. And I think that just being conscious of the fact that the standard American diet is definitely, you know, leading people to obesity, heart disease, and cancer and to find what the alternative is. So the alternative is just being conscious of the ingredients for starters and Beyond that, you can make it work with vegan, with carnivore, any combination in between. But the main thing is being conscious of the ingredients and the quality of what you're eating. And yeah, yeah. just to follow up on what you were saying before about you being nervous to eat the raw, the raw chicken the first time, that's totally the feeling I had when I ate a raw steak for the first time. And it's like, yeah, nothing happens. And it really is all these warning labels on eggs and on meat that say you have to cook it to a certain degree. It's all fucking bullshit. Like... I mean, I know that there is some level of danger involved, but I've been eating these raw steaks for almost a year now, and I've never even gotten a stomachache once from them, even when I've let it be a little bit even older than I would like it to be. And another thing I'm eating a lot of now is raw eggs. It's just, you know, I've always loved eggs. I've loved scrambled eggs. I've loved fried eggs. But, you know, cleaning the pan has always been a pain in the ass. <laughs> and sure. also, like, if you're traveling, you could be totally cut off from eggs if you're not willing to eat one raw. But so, like, when I've been going on trips now to these conventions, I'm having raw eggs for breakfast every day. Like, I have three raw eggs. And I, I'm only buying one specific brand because I have heard that, you know, if you get a brand you trust and then you switch to something else, like, you know, go to, like, a cheaper egg, for, for example, um, you might have a problem. But... I, I only buy this one brand, Vital Farms, but I think pretty much any organic brand of eggs would work. And I mean, you can eat them raw. Like, it's fine. Like, I've heard you don't even have to, you, they don't even refrigerate eggs in Europe, but I, do, I yeah. do refrigerate them to stay safe. But it's like, all these warning labels are just fear mongering. And it's, and it's just another, you know, our culture fear mongering again and trying to control what you eat. And, you know, what they really don't tell you is that any level of cooking actually degrades the food, especially if it's charred. Now, I have heard that cooking it at a lower temperature, like with a sous vide machine, is another thing I discovered when I was doing this diagram. I discovered that one of my friends actually locally, who actually was the closest friend that lives near me, he's doing a carnivore diet and he eats hard boiled eggs, but he uses sous vide machine to cook meat. And that cooks it at a lower temperature, like around 140 degrees for two hours. And supposedly that level of cooking actually makes it more digestible. But I think either way, you know, if you, if you want to sous vide at a low temperature or even eat it raw or just cook it lightly. But 
uh, the way a lot of uh, food is served in restaurants, like when it's just charred, charred to hell, like it looks like it's been to hell and back, <laughs> that is adding acrylamides and carcinogens to your food. So, you know, if, if you're cooking it to make it safer or healthier, but you're adding carcinogens, you've got a little bit of a problem there. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to be careful too with, and this is what you learn when you start going down this path is the type of pans that you're cooking in, the type of pots that you're cooking in are toxic for the most part. You know, if you go down to the Walmart or the the Target or wherever, and you're just buying, you know, just like really standard cookware, like that shit is toxic. And it's not just like aluminum is there's some problems with even ceramic cookware and uh, cast iron too on some level. Like you have to be very vigilant if you want to go the whole distance here. And then to your point about the raw food, and I found that out with the, the with the raw dairy, if you just compare, you know, the difference between the average grocery store milk and the raw milk that I'm buying now is one much higher fat content. There's virtually no fat, even in full fat uh, dairy products in the grocery store, it's not as much actual fat as there is in the raw milk. And the nutrient levels are so much higher because there's no pasteurization, which is essentially just heating up everything. It's killing all the good bacteria, zapping some of those nutrients. Most milks, especially plant milks, which I would totally avoid if I was a vegan or anybody, to be honest, is that, you know, these things are fortified with vitamin D. There's not any naturally occurring vitamin D in these milks for the most part, because it's all zapped out from the pasteurization and then sort of added back chemically afterwards. In the raw milk, you get that natural, you know, vitamin D that we're all really lacking, right? We're not outside as much these days, but some friendly advice there for people who might be on the fence there about well, why are these guys eating raw meat and drinking raw milk? Well, I mean, we're not doing it every day, but we are dabbling. So, and there there are reasons for it. There is good science behind this stuff if you just, you know, go on to PubMed and do some research, I guess. So, yeah, um, during my vegan period, I did a lot of juicing. So a lot of green juices with, you know, low sugar ones, but primarily greens, cucumbers, celery. And they would always taste completely different when I made them at home through my centrifugal juicer. Then when I would go to a restaurant, go to a store and get one in a bottle. And the difference is not only that it sat in a cabinet for, you know, however many days, but that most of the ones you buy in a bottle are either pressure pasteurized or past just some, some way pasteurized. And that is in a sense killing a lot of the nutrients that's in whatever it is. And when you, when you make it yourself and drink it straight off the juicer, it really feels like it's alive, you know? Yeah. And when, it, when it's in a bottle and it's been pasteurized, a lot of vegans talk about live food versus dead food. And I think that is a real thing. But, you know, they're saying that anything is dead if it's an animal and everything is alive if it's a plant. And for me, <laughs> I did a meme about this that actually illustrated it very clearly. So I have a second Instagram account called Dr. Conspiracy. I think it's Dr. Dot Conspiracy on Instagram. And I did a meme showing you that it's really more live food. If you look at like raw dairy, raw meat, raw vegetables, raw fruits, as opposed to anything cooked or processed, because that's where you get like the living cultured, like there's cultural bacteria in there that actually helps your gut and anything that's cooked to a degree that it destroys cells. It just lowers the level of nutrition. So I'm still all about that raw. <laughs> <laughs> Same, you know, I mean, I, would never say like only eat meat. Like I'm not a doctor. Or I'm not a full nutritionist yet. Hopefully I will be one day, I guess. But you know, like I'm not, I would never suggest just from what I know, like to be a full fledged carnivore and eat only meat or raw meat at that. Like I think that plants and vegetables, they have a place in a, a well-balanced diet. And I think that's what I would ultimately strive for is a well-balanced diet. But I would kind of be low carb, I think for the most part, maybe not full keto all the time, but Definitely low carb because I don't really find much nutritional benefit to carbohydrates. Like it's really just a source of energy and your body can run more optimally on other sources like fat or amino acids from the proteins. So I just did want to mention the part of the healing web on the far left where instead of the solid lines, I do dotted lines. And so those dotted lines are actually causation lines and when you're on the left side of the diagram, there's actually some solid lines hitting points that would be causations of the symptom in the middle that should be dotted lines, but I was going to have too, too many dotted lines. Basically, like there's so many things within mainstream diet and within big pharma that are actually causing these symptoms that I had to like change the diagram itself to show you 
that basically like within here, like factory farming, fast food, overcooking, MSG, artificial coloring, high fructose corn syrup, GMOs, caffeine, Franken, <laughs> vegan Franken food, excess soy, fried food, processed food and meat, sugar. It's just like, there's so many things that are like staples of most Americans diet that are just really horrible for your body. And I just, I wish more people would be more conscious of it. And I know people are like addicted to these sort of pleasure foods, but you know, I, I look around the world and like, you know, obesity is such a big problem that it's like people just really, I guess they don't know, or like they don't, they don't want to do anything about it or they're just, they just love Coke too much. (laughs) And I I just want to help people. You know, I want people to be healthy and not have to, you know, suffer through someone in their family getting cancer or heart disease and it, this things that everybody can do themselves, they just have to know what to do. Because I mean, so many people wouldn't even know how to eat right if they were trying to, you know, people try to go on a diet when they're overweight, and they end up like, eating stuff that's just other stuff that's unhealthy. And so this is really trying to be a guide for people of how you can avoid that standard American diet, and what a healthier diet might look like. It's not just one option, but it's just trying to get down to like the pure foods. Yeah. And, you know, obviously I think if you're going to make any sort of commitment to your own health, like starting with your, your actual diet of of food is important, but I've come to the idea or the mindset that your diet is whatever you're exposing your body and your mind to, you know, it it is this holistic approach. And and that's why I mentioned laughter earlier and things like that. And, you know, I was obviously happy to see things on the diagram, you know, about water and light and sound healing. This is all things that are rabbit holes unto themselves, you know, when you start to really dig into that. But I am curious, you know, as it relates to like maybe those three specifically, water, light and sound, what did you learn in those areas that you've now implemented into your day-to-day life too? Well, so I just got back from AlienCon. I listened to about 10 different podcasts on the way down there. And I listened to one on, I think, the higher side chat that was just all about tuning forks. I forget the woman's name, but she's like the expert on tuning forks. And it's just like, that's just one therapy that, you know, she she was talking for a good like hour and a half about just using that to cure all different ailment, ailments. And so, you know, that's one thing I have listed under sound healing. I also have singing bowls, chanting, drumming. Just those, I mean, just recently, I went to this Equinox Festival that's run by Native Americans at Serpent Mound. And just to be a part of that Native American drumming and their singing, it's like you can feel the healing benefits of it. And, you know, so many people don't even think about that, that that singing could actually be beneficial to their own health. But it really is like it helps depression, it helps every cell in your body that, you know, hearing these frequencies can really cure disease. So, So there's a lot with sound. I mean, I've also discovered, um, I have this sound C sharp that I looked up on YouTube. I heard it was like a healing frequency. And I set this as like the first thing that comes on my iPhone when I plug it into the car. So it comes on, it's like, boom. (laughs) And it's just like, I mean, you can feel the healing frequency is kind of like, like music from like the inside of the womb, you know, and there's just all, all different sounds that can be very healing. A light one. Let's see, I have light therapy there, photo, photodynamic, red light, infrared saunas, sun, sunshine. You know, I haven't been doing too much light therapy myself, but I would like to get into more of it. I try to, you know, it's obviously good to get sunshine. <laughs> I think you can get a little bit depressed like in the winter when it's too many overcast days in a row. I used to like go to a tanning bed in the winter a couple of times, but I don't do that so much anymore. But I do know people that have like a sunlight machine that sort of gives them sunlight in the winter, like in your room. That's not necessarily a tanning bed, but just like a light you look at. What was the third one? Nature? Mentioned water, actually. Oh, water. Oh, yeah. I mean, water is just critical. I mean, you got to not drink the tap water. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I use a gravity filter, but there's all different types. You know, I list on the back a couple of good ones. Like I use an Alexa Pure, but I think Berkey's like kind of the top of the line for a gravity filter. And then if you own your own house, obviously installing some kind of a complex system that filters the whole house would be ideal. I also use a shower filter, which I've been using for several years. I mean, since I was in New York, which, you know, I think with water, it's like, you never really know if you got all the fluoride out or not, but as long as you're being conscious of it and trying that it'll be better than not doing anything. And then there's all different ways to structure your water as well. I mean, I've seen people doing like 
adding like vortex energy to their water, adding crystal energy to your water. I, we were just talking today, I had like my uh, truth or brunch in Cincinnati and someone was talking about putting a silver dollar at the bottom of your water to sort of just have a little bit of that silver like infiltrating into the water. Uh, so there's all sorts of little things you can do to make your water healthier. And it's like, you're not going to probably do any of them like all the time, but you know, maybe try a couple different ones and see what you feel like is working the best and then incorporate that. Like I drink a ton of lemon juice and water, probably too much. <laughs> I'm kind of addicted <laughs> to lemon water. But yeah, I drink basically all water from my gra- from my gravity filter, my Alexa Pure, and really try to not, if, if I'm traveling, I'll drink smart water. But you know, I try not to drink plastic bottled water as much as I can or tap water ever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even the plastic bottled water, the good ones even, you know, still leaching plastic from the bottle, even if it says BPA free. I mean, there's all types of other contaminants too in there. So yeah, I, I would also recommend uh, Kangen water, which is good. I think you have that on here too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you do have that on there. I've had that a few times at some some local health food stores actually, and it, it's vital shit, man. It makes me feel really good when I drink it. It's almost like an immediate sort of sensation for me. So, but yeah, I do have a Berkey filter as well at home. So Highly recommended nice. there, but you know, and uh, sorry, just to circle back, you mentioned the uh, the lady who does the tuning forks. That's Eileen Day McCusick. She was actually I had her on the show about three years ago. So Gray Carl Wood, you're welcome. <laughs> but anyways, so yeah, she she's a great lady, uh, and sound healing is something that I've taken uh, a bit more seriously too. I, I actually record all my episodes here at 432 hertz. It was something when I first started the show a few years ago that I sort of like advertised as like a almost like a marketing differentiator, you know, from my marketing background. Like, why should you listen to this show? Well, because (laughs) I'm looking out for your health here because I'm recording at like an actual frequency that, you know, is supposedly healthy for you. And there is some some good research on that. Uh, So I was glad to see that 432 hertz is uh, on the healing web too here. So I'm not really sure what else to say about this other than I just fucking love that you put this all together. And it's it is hard to decipher. It's hard to sort of work your way through it. But you know, and you can start in the center, actually. And, you know, if you have any sort of ailment, you know, and it's, these are major things, but I think like, you know, even something like cold and flu viruses, which we all deal with on some level, especially as we're, you know, coming up into these the change of seasons where a lot of people do, you know, tend to get you know, some sort of bug, right? But, you know, there are easy ways to go about preventing that, easy ways to go about treating that, you know, more holistically. And, you know, hopefully it never comes back. But yeah, I will mention like part of my whole experience with alternative medicine sort of started with when I lived in New York, I would get always sinus infections, especially like if I had a cold, it would always develop into a sinus infection. And I took, I don't know how many Z packs to cure these. And then they started giving me like stronger antibiotics. And eventually I found, I think like through like Oprah or something like not by the doctor's recommendation, but I found nasal irrigation or like a neti pot. Oh yeah. It's great. was the solution to these um, sinus infections. And I never had one that I needed antibiotics for after I discovered that neti pot. And just that moment alone is really one of the main things that sent me down this alternative health rabbit hole and to discover all these other different alternative remedies. Just the fact that my doctor hadn't told me about like the basic way to wash my nose out and would rather give me antibiotics over and over and over again to the point that I was at the point where like if my antibiotics didn't work for that last sinus infection, like I was going to have to have sinus surgery. So the fact that a doctor would give you surgery before even suggesting like a basic way of rinsing your sinuses is just that speaks to Western medicine. It's like, that's so classic of Western medicine that like they won't tell you these easy solutions. They'd rather you pay for a surgery than just tell you the way to really help yourself. Well, that's because medicine, hospitals, doctors are businesses. At the end of the day, they have to make money. And the big, the high fashion product that they're selling, to go back to your background, is surgery. Like that's the most expensive product that they sell. And of course they want you to buy it, you know? So if, mm-hmm. if surgery is an option on on anything that you have, like they're going to pitch that to you first and foremost. And then I found out though, that if you're not interested, like unless you have like a broken bone of some sort where surgery is probably necessary, although I've heard some interesting stories about how it's not even necessary for broken bones sometimes, or, you know, like maybe torn tendons or torn ligaments, like surgery is always pitched to you for those things. But if you just say, I'm not interested in that, a good doctor will tell you the other options that you do have. 
but they're going to always try to sell you on that most expensive thing that, that they're offering, which, you know, is a, a surgery of some sort. And just to go back to what you said about sinus infections, I had the same thing. I started seeing a, a naturopath about a year and a half ago for the same reason. I just had what I would call like chronic sinus infections that I would get one, I would get over it. And then within the next couple of weeks, I'd have another one and it would last, you know, another seven to 10 days. And I just like went through about probably two to three months where I was just like every other week or something. I had just, I had a sinus infection of some sort. And the first thing she told me, get a fucking neti pot. And dude, yeah, since so good. it does since then. And then we also shifted my diet around. So that helped to, you know, just, you know, repopulating good gut bacteria and a, a full detox and some heavy metal detoxes as well with that. And dude, I have never been healthier. I have not been what I would call sick for a year and a half. No sinus infections. I had allergies when I was a kid that I don't have anymore. Or at least I feel like I don't have. I have not had the same sort of reaction to things, I guess, that I've had traditionally. So, yeah, man, I Dude, mean, there's we're something right on to the same this. Page. Me too. I used to have allergies and now I don't anymore. And I think it's mainly because of diet. And, you know, I see other people in my family still having allergies, still taking like Zyrtec and Flonase and all this stuff. And like all that stuff always just rubbed me the wrong way. I just felt like it wasn't the way to fix the problem. And now that I basically cured my allergies, I guess through diet or just like all different types of lifestyle choices that it really makes me believe in the holistic medicine is the better answer most of the time. Now, I know some people like if you have a rare form of cancer, holistic medicine might not be able to treat it, but at least to know your options. I mean, one of the main reasons I made this was just to have all the options on one sheet of paper to remember them because it's, it's really easy to forget some of these things, even like basic cold remedies that I do. Like I use this, um, sometimes I use a, a nasal breath aid, which is just basically something that stretches out your nose. It's another thing that can help prevent sinus infections, but just yeah. there's so much in the, on the alternative side that I think is easy to just forget about. And so even if you are healthy already, you might just want to even look into some of these things like with spiritual healing or like electric medicine. I mean, if you, you're already healthy, maybe it could enhance your abilities even more, like enhance your strength, enhance your cognitive skills, enhance your psychic skills. Um, certainly anti-aging techniques could be relevant to everyone, whether you're sick or not. Yeah. And, you know, just to people listening, like I always encourage people, you know, stay open-minded too. Like, you know, we talked about the the raw meat diet earlier, you know, if you're a vegan out there or you're plant-based or whatever, if you're offended by that, you know, I'm sorry, but don't knock it until you try it. I understand, you know, from a compassionate standpoint, like I will never argue against that. But, you know, and just in terms of like full-fledged health, you know, from the inside out, like, please just do not say anything against it unless you've actually tried it yourself. But also keep in mind, our health is individual to us. Like it's, it's unique to us. So what works for me might not work for you. What works for Dylan might not work for you. I mean, I think that's something that we have to keep in mind too. Yeah. And like I said, it's like any combination of these different diets can work. Like I think some people can work pure vegan, some can work pure carnivore. I think most people will probably do best with a, a little bit of a combination of both of those. But then, you know, when I did this healing web, I was really kind of against the idea of fruitarian, of liquidarian, and of breatharian. But I've actually even in the time since I did this, I've, I've encountered some people and, you know, heard about different people's diets and lifestyles where I've been like, you know what, maybe these, these really extreme diets actually can work for people. And even like, I mean, breath Aryan is obviously the most extreme, which means only eating breath or air. But apparently, you know, there have been yogis or people that, you know, really can like meditate so hard that they generate this like prana in their throat and they can live on that. I mean, I don't think you're going to be gaining weight on breath Aryan. <laughs> But you could probably there, I think there are ways you could sustain your weight, depending on what you're doing. You know, if if you're if you're a mover or like construction worker, like breatharian is definitely not gonna work. But if you're like a yogi just sitting in one place most of the day and like meditating, then you know, you definitely don't need three meals a day, like maybe not even two, maybe not even one. So it just all depends on your lifestyle too. You know, if you're trying to build, if you're trying to just maintain, if you're trying to lose weight, obviously breatharian is very ideal. <laughs> Not sustainable, though. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you want to watch out for malnutrition. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, like, I'm on the fence about intermittent fasting, for example, because, you know, uh, it sounds great. Like, there's some science there. But there's also, like, uh, you slow your metabolism way down, too, if you do in that long term. 
and or even just short term. And I'm not really sure if that is healthy, but I don't know. That's why I'm becoming like I'm becoming more wary of things like this because they're becoming so popular. Like keto is like I could I walked into Walmart, which I hate doing, but you know sometimes you have to. I live in a small town, so it's, it's the only option sometimes. But I walked into Walmart a couple weeks ago, and man, it's keto everywhere. And I I stepped back from that stuff, and I'm like, okay, I've actually tried that diet. I felt really great on it. I lost some weight. I was probably more energetic than I had been in years. But now I'm like, you know, if it's so mainstream, like, this is my conspiratorial side, Dylan. Like, what's really behind this? Is it really that good for me? Even though I do have firsthand, you know, sort of success with it. But I'm not sure what you think about that kind of stuff these days. But that and, like, the fasting and I just hear it talked about so much that I'm almost like, okay, is there, like, a flip side to this? Yeah, I think some things just become trendy and then get taken to extreme. And obviously, I think any food at Walmart is probably not high enough quality to, for it to matter if you're doing keto or not. <laughs> I will say that when I released this diagram, the only part that anyone talked about was this little bubble in the bottom right that says proceed with caution, which was originally um, warning, I think. <laughs> and so, you know, there's these certain alternative remedies that well, I have fad diets in here and that fad diet sort of can be expanded into like fad, any type of alternative remedy. So, you know, you have combo, which is burning frog poison into your skin. That's supposed to be like the super spiritual, like detoxing your demons and your body practice, which I know some people swear by it, but <laughs> it's just, I think it's proceeded with caution. You know, <laughs> I don't even want to say warning yeah. anymore because people, I had people attack me, like literally attack me for like almost every point within this little proceed with caution bubble. And I'm just like, dude, all it's saying is proceed with caution. <laughs> like, um, you know, homeopathic doctors were like, oh, why is homeopathy in there? And it's like, well, you know, if you know what homeopathy is, it's basically a sugar pill with an energy signature of some kind of poison that's the antidote to a, 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 something wrong with your body. It's just, it's kind of, um, it's a little bit woo. And I know I, I am totally woo myself. And I understand that some of these woo things could be legit, but I'm saying proceed with caution. And you know, I got a lot of flack for this being anti-vegan at first, which I was like, that's not what I'm trying to say. That's not what I want people to concentrate on. But so yeah, anything with, within this proceed with caution, I mean, anything in the alternative realm is proceed with caution, but some things just, it's very subjective what I decided to put in the proceed with caution bubble. You know, we have like witch doctor, we have faith healing. So I didn't want that to be the focus and it became the focus. And I got into these wars with vegans, which I'm like, I was one of you, like I'm trying to help you, <laughs> but um, there, there's definitely a lot of useful information on here. And I think everyone should have a look at it. Yeah, in that proceed with caution bubble, uh, the alkaline diet is there. And so is Dr. Sebi's name, uh, who kind of helped popularize the alkaline diet. And it's interesting that you put that there because I also tried that. And I, I don't know, I did not like it. My body did not respond well to it. Uh, but that's mostly like fruits and vegetables, I guess, for the most part. Most try to be pure alkaline diet. It's actually mostly just vegetables, mostly just green vegetables. And I think there's a couple of fruits that are considered alkaline, but it's like you're starving yourself if you really try to go like pure alkaline diet and you look at like there's these lists you can find online of alkaline versus acidic and it doesn't even really make any sense because your body is programmed to regulate the acidity no matter what you eat right. and if your body goes to acid or alkaline you die so to try to it's just there, there's some science there but i'm not sure if it's completely if it makes sense and i think that has definitely gone overboard with people you know, treating alkaline diet like a religion, like it's like the only cure to cancer, like it's a cure to everything, really. I mean, I, I was at one point thinking like alkaline diet was going to cure my hair loss. And if anything, eating just vegetables and not getting enough, you know, protein and other nutrients probably contributed more to my hair loss. Yeah, I mean, gosh, we could talk about hair loss for three hours, but uh, I think we should probably get going here soon because it is getting late for us uh, here. Well, yeah, I never that, found so. the perfect remedy to hair loss. I think that is partially just genetic. Like a lot of things are genetic. Yeah. You know, I six pack is pretty much genetic for some people. Hair loss is genetic. I happen to have really good pecs, which I never expected when I was a teenager, but that's genetic. <laughs> I, you know, I barely do any push ups. So you just got to accept your body. And I mean, that kind of gets a little bit into how I listed um, gender dysphoria as one of the symptoms that I think, you know, doctors are really pushing surgical remedies to like 
dissatisfaction with people's bodies, you know, the whole thing with women and getting boob jobs that I think a lot of this stems to, I have written on here, like self-acceptance or self-expression and, you know, just accepting, you know, the genes you have to work with and not, not falling into the trap of thinking there has to be a surgical solution to make you who you're supposed to be. Couldn't agree more with that, man. Could not agree more. So Dude, Dylan Lewis Monroe. Wow. I mean, I don't even know how to wrap this up other than to just say, you know, tell people where they can find your work if they're interested, you know, give them your social media information and whatever else you want to plug, man. Well, we've gone two really different directions with the Cult of Bale and the Healing Lab is sort of like the (laughs) polar opposite of my work thus far within this project. But my main website is deepstatemappingproject.com. I offer free downloads of all these diagrams, very high resolution, so high you could actually make a poster, but I would appreciate if you like my work to support it by buying a poster or a t-shirt. And then my main platform for sharing on a sort of daily basis is Instagram. My, my handle is Master Conspiracy at present. I'm thinking about changing it. So if I change it, just check back to deepstatemappingproject.com because that's not going to change, at least for the time being. Then my new YouTube channel, New Templars, is on YouTube. And we're covering a lot of these topics. Um, not so much healing web topics, more like conspiracy. Like we sort of, in a way, consider ourselves to be like the military police of the truther community. So... <laughs> You know, we're calling out people that are spreading bullshit, um, but also just getting into different subjects within this whole realm. So check that out. Uh, We have a Deep State Mapping Project Facebook, Deep State Mapping Project Facebook group on Facebook, which has really been growing as a source where people can share different articles and have discussions about all of these different subjects. So yeah, that's the direction that we're going in. And I I think my next diagram, I'm sort of planning it to be related to energy. So I'm really interested in alternative energy and learning about like atmospheric energy and magnetic energy. And, you know, if if we're not going to have these technologies declassified, like I'm going to have to invent them myself and become the next next Nikola Tesla. So, you know, fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to get this information channeled straight to me. So that's sort of what's down the pipe. You know, I, I, I think I am like you, you know, I'm a little bit wary or I'm a little bit tired of just being so consumed by conspiracies and like dark occultists. And I'm ready to look more into like this heal thyself direction and into like proactively learning more about technology. And so that's the direction that the mapping project is headed in. So you never know what's next, but I think it's really important to keep these diagrams available to people and to keep spreading them. Because, you know, no matter how woke we get or, you know, how deep we get into the occult, um, there are certain people who just are still completely clueless, you know, chugging Diet Coke and, you know, taking statins and just not knowing at all what's going on in the world. So I think, you know, the Q web is still like my masterwork, sort of like all encompassing. And I, I hope that still spreads. But like I said, the cult of Bill is really what newcomers gravitate towards more. And I'm I'm going to have the Healing Web poster soon. And I, I really hope that that explodes. And I'd, I'd love to see that Healing Web poster in, you know, different chiropractic clinics, different holistic clinics all over the country and the world, because I think that's really a great guide to just show people all the options that are available on the alternative side and all the reasons why you might want to be a little bit more skeptical of the big pharma treatments. So yeah, that's my spiel for now. And thanks for having me on. <laughs> No problem, man. No problem. I really do appreciate your time. We talked for you know longer than I think we both thought we might. So I do appreciate you hanging out for as long as you did. And you know, good luck with the projects moving forward, obviously. And I will absolutely have that healing web on my wall whenever you get around to making that poster. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Dylan Lewis Monroe. That dude has put together a hell of a project over there with Deep State Mapping. But, you know, more than the Q-Web that he's most known for, it was these two diagrams in particular that really piqued my interest the most, the Cult of Baal, because I think it fits snugly into what occulture is on many levels, and the Healing Web, because I think it's the most practical of all of Dylan's work. It's also right in my wheelhouse, too, as you could probably tell when we got into that part of the conversation. Uh, So please do check out Dylan's work if you're not familiar with it, and throw him a couple bucks while you're at it and get a poster or two on your wall. And with that, that brings this episode and this podcast to a close. This is it. I don't have a whole lot to say other than thank you. Sincerely. And this has been such a rewarding journey for me. I've learned a lot about myself, which is one of the reasons I started this. And I hope you learned a lot about yourself too. 
And this podcast was, I think, far too intimate and introspective and personal to ever be more than whatever I thought it could be when I started it. But once I realized what was happening here, I just let it take me wherever it wanted to take me. And what was happening was, I was writing a, a love letter, I think, to a version of myself that no longer exists. And we've talked many times about, you know, shadow integration and embracing those aspects of yourself that are maybe not so attractive and not so admirable, and just owning that. Because if you don't own it, you can't integrate it, and if you can't integrate it, you can't overcome it. All those bad habits and tendencies, the self-sabotaging behaviors we all struggle with, you know, they have to be recognized. The light needs to be shown on that darkness because that's the only way it gets flushed out, uh, spiritual and psychological and emotional detox. And, you know, after three plus years of doing this, I think I've flushed out those toxins, maybe not all of them, but enough to be able to look at myself in the mirror and finally recognize my own light and just be proud of who I've become and what I've accomplished. Because my life has not been easy. It's been my own fault, too, and it's been many years of shifting and placing blame on others and not taking enough personal responsibility and not holding myself accountable to the same level that I hold others to. You know, putting myself out there like I have with this project is not something I ever thought I could do. I learned how to be vulnerable with myself and with others, though, which is something I, I wasn't good at in the past. I was a shy kid, antisocial at times, dealt with a speech impediment for years that contributed to some of that shyness and antisocialness, and also issues a lot of us deal with, you know, issues I've had to work hard to overcome, like anxiety and paranoia and learning how to trust others and learning how to appreciate others and learning how to love others in ways they want and need to be loved, and also learning how to trust myself and love myself and appreciate me for me. You know, I'm not perfect, I'm deeply flawed, and trying to hide from those flaws is what's gotten me in trouble, because I always thought I was this loving, caring, supportive, insightful, uh, intelligent, witty person, and, you know, that is who I am, but I blinded myself to my own bullshit to the point where I thought I had no room for improvement, and boy was I wrong about that. Once I made the decision to confront my own flaws, you know, that's when this project was born. And I'm extremely grateful that I took the chance on myself and that you came along for the ride and took that chance too. And I hope that in some small way that listening to this has helped you or encouraged you or inspired you to take a, a similar personal inventory. Because to me, that's what any religious or spiritual pursuit is about, not about what's happening externally. All of it is just a metaphor that, if you clue yourself in on the right level, will help you better understand you. Try not to get too caught up in the drama of it all, you know, the geopolitical theater, the digital and social media life suck, and this, I don't know, this relentless pursuit of everything beyond the present moment, it's all pretty vampiric, and it's draining you of vital resources. Time, mostly, but also your energy, your vibes, you know? These are your currencies. Spend them wisely. You know, think twice before you add Disney Plus to your list of things you don't need. And also, because fuck Disney. But anyway, I will return at some point with a new podcast, a new project of some sort, some slightly different subject matter, and something that is, I think, rather unique. I don't see many people doing this, or any person doing it, really. It's an exciting idea to me, and when I'm excited about something, I tend to go pretty hard with it. But I'm going to take some time to myself before I do that. No timetable for when this new thing happens, but when it does, it'll be actually right here on this feed. So stay subscribed if you want. This feed will stay active, and all the episodes will remain available. The Patreon will also stay active for any new listeners who want to hear the extensions. Literally just a couple bucks a month if you want to hear probably, you know, 100 hours of bonus content. And that's patreon.com slash oldculture for anyone interested. Patrons will also get an epilogue episode of sorts from me sometime in the next few weeks whenever I get done writing it. It's a solo show that I wanted to do a while ago but just never got around to finishing. Uh, it's part narrative storytelling, part investigative journalism in a way. It's been fun putting it together and it's a nice fitting end to this project for me. So... If you want to hear that, again, the URL is patreon.com slash occulture. So, patrons, I will speak to you again soon, but for everyone else, stay weird. Life's more interesting that way. And this has been the Occulture Podcast. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. <laughs>
please rewind this cassette.